The co-chairman of the President's Commission on the BP Deepwater Horizon oil spill testified today on Capitol Hill. The Commission's final report, released this month, calls for sweeping changes in how the petroleum industry operates. This hearing of the House Natural Resources Committee is three hours. Rule 4F, any oral opening statements at hearings are limited to the chairman and the ranking minority member. This will allow us to hear from our witnesses sooner and help keep members uh, on their schedules. If other members have statements, they can be included in the uh, hearing record under unanimous consent. And so I ask unanimous consent that all members' opening day statements be made part of the hearing record if they are submitted to the chief clerk by 5 p.m. today. Here, no objection, so ordered. We have two uh, witnesses today, and I'll make the formal introductions after our uh, opening statements, but I'm very pleased that uh, they are here. They're spending uh, all day on the Hill. Uh, the first part of the day was spent on the other side of the Capitol, and now they're here, and I'll welcome them formally in a moment. It's been nine months since the horrific explosion and oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico that resulted in the death of 11 men and burning and the sinking of the Deepwater Horizon rig. Since then, nearly 5 million barrels of oil spilled into the Gulf resulted in the economic displacement of tens of thousands of fishermen, tourist workers, and people connected to the offshore industry, energy industry. The oil spill was a terrible tragedy and the effects are still being felt today. As this committee proceeds with its oversight duties, we must be mindful of how we respond because that response could significantly impact American energy policy in the future. The response to this event could be the difference between making offshore drilling the safest in the world or locking up our resources, putting more, Amer putting more Americans out of work and further relying on foreign countries for our energy needs. It is because of these serious implications that I have stressed from day one the need to have all of the facts and information surrounding the cause of this incident before there is a rush to judgment or a rush to legislate. When President Obama announced that he was personally appointing an oil spill commission, many in Congress and around the country were deeply concerned with both the makeup and the mandate of the commission. There were concerns that the President's Commission didn't have enough uh, experts in engineering or experience in the oil and gas industry, and that it was comprised of individuals who had dedicated a significant portion of their career to opposing oil and gas drilling. While understanding these concerns, I kept and am keeping an open mind on the recommendation of the President's Commission. This is why this is the first scheduled committee hearing in this Congress, and I'm hearing, anxious to hearing from the co-chairs. This report provides further insight into the accident and will be a factor in Congress's discussions. However, even with the Commission's report, we still don't know precisely what caused the explosion or why the blowout preventer failed to work. Now, there will be additional reports from the Joint Coast Guard BOEM Marine Board hearings and the Chemical Safety Board hearings, uh, and, and hopefully they will provide answers to these lingering questions, among others. Through this uncertainty, what I do know for sure is that America needs American-made energy. We need to keep and create American jobs, and we need to mitigate America's dependence on foreign energy that threatens potentially our national security. The oil spill, as I mentioned, was a terrible tragedy, but it should not be used as an excuse to further reduce America's access to our energy resources. Some in Congress view this spill as an opportunity to shut down offshore drilling. To me, that is not a solution. That is giving up. This legislation aimed at the, the legislation aimed at this goal was introduced last year and will predictably be proposed again in this Congress. This despite the strong support among the American people for continued offshore energy productions. 
Republicans want to make offshore energy drilling the safest in the world. We believe in the need to make smart, effective reforms that are centered on improving safety, putting people back to work, and allowing responsible drilling to move forward. The right response to this, this bill is to focus on making drilling safe, not impossible. The importance of this committee's future work cannot be understated. Gas prices are steadily rising. Iran has assumed the presidency of OPEC, and rigs are leaving the Gulf for foreign countries like Cuba, Brazil, and Mexico, taking American jobs with them. This isn't speculation. It's happening. My colleagues from the Gulf can attest to the real economic pain being felt by people and businesses due to this administration's drilling moratorium. Production in the Gulf of Mexico has already fallen by more than 200,000 barrels per day and is predicted by the Energy Information Administration to fall by more than 500,000 barrels per day by 2012. Every barrel that we don't produce from the Gulf means more lost revenue to the federal government, more lost jobs, and additional transfer of American wealth to hostile nations. I believe in American ingenuity. And I know that we can get this right. The answer is to address what went wrong and make smart reforms and allow drilling to resume. The stakes are too high to give up. Our economic competitiveness, American jobs, and national security are online. And with that, I recognize the distinguished ranking member. I thank uh, the chairman very much, and, uh, and we thank you. Uh, and on behalf of the Democratic members of the committee, please accept our sincere congratulations uh, on your appointment as chairman. Um, we on this side of the aisle look forward to a productive working relationship with, with you and with the majority, occasionally punctuated by knockdown, drag out fights over issues that we all care about deeply. While I applaud the chairman for holding this hearing today, I am also deeply saddened that this hearing is necessary. Industry and federal regulators assured the American public that a disaster like the BP Deepwater Horizon spill could not happen. The events of last April and the subsequent investigations have demonstrated that those assurances were worthless. The American people are left to count the economic and environmental costs, and 11 families are left without their loved ones. It is vital to our nation's energy future that we examine the causes of this tragedy with clear eyes, assess the lessons to be learned with open minds, and commit ourselves to fundamental reform with firm resolve. In the testimony submitted for this hearing, the Commission co-chairman, and we thank you both so much for your service to our country, point out that, quote, the United States has the highest reported rate of fatalities per hours worked in offshore oil and ga gas drilling among its international peers. Mr. Chairman, that shocking statistic does not mean that BP or Transocean or Halliburton operate unsafely. It means that the entire American offshore oil and gas industry operates unsafely compared to its international peers. To quote from our witnesses again, the central lesson to be drawn from the catastrophe is that no less than an overhauling of both current industry practices and government oversight is now required. Mr. Chairman, this is not a time for half measures or tinkering around the edges. This is a time for bold reforms. The lives lost and the damage done as a result of this tragedy require nothing short of fundamental change in the way we conduct the business of offshore oil and gas development and production. I am proud that Democrats in the House took a major step towards such an overhaul by passing the Consolidated Land, Energy, and Aquatic Resources Act in the last Congress. Known as the CLEAR Act, the legislation included many of the recommendations contained in the Commission's report. While my colleagues on the Republican side 
may not have liked all that was in that legislation. It is my hope that now that the Commission has made many of the same recommendations, that we can work together in a bipartisan effort to craft new legislation. To that end, I have joined with ranking members Waxman and Rahal, Miller and Johnson, along with energy ranking member Rush Holt and other members, to introduce new legislation combining the best elements of the CLEAR Act with recommendations from the Commission. We welcome review of that legislation by the Commission and by our colleagues on both sides of the aisle. If we are short-sighted and complacent, today's hearing will be an end. If we are visionary and engaged, today's hearing is only the beginning of having America have the safest and most productive oil and natural gas industry. That should be our goal, and that is the goal which I think every American should be aiming to uh, achieve uh, in any legislation which we pass. In closing, again, let me offer my sincere gratitude to Senator Graham, uh, to you, Administrator Riley, uh, and to all of the Commission members and the staff for their Herculean effort and their willingness to take on this investigation and their dedication to completing it in such a short period of time and with such thoroughness. This committee and the American people are in your debt, uh, and I thank you for your efforts, uh, and I thank the, the chairman for extending me those few extra seconds. I thank the gentleman, and, and I thank the gentleman for his uh, opening comments. I, too, look uh, forward to working with you. And I, I want to welcome the two witnesses here today. I know that uh, since this event happened uh, and since the uh, appointment of the commission, uh, there was a, a lot of work done by, by both of you. Uh, the Honorable Bill O'Reilly is a former administrator of EPA and, of course, on the Hill, uh, people do remember the Florida, uh, Florida Senator uh, Bob Graham and former governor, if I'm not mistaken, of the state of Florida. So certainly there is uh, expertise. So with that, I would just say that uh, remind you that under committee rules, you have five minutes for your oral testimony. However, your full record, uh, your full statement will appear in the record. Uh, you note on, on over here, we have these little boxes that have green lights, green lights, yellow lights, and red lights. Uh, when the red light comes on, you know you're at five minutes. When the green light's on, you are up to four minutes and you have uh, four and a half minutes and you have 30 seconds with the L. So with that, uh, uh, we'll allow both of you to testify and then we'll open up to questions to uh, uh, an eager committee that wants to, uh, to talk. And so with that, I'll uh, first introduce uh, Mr. Riley. Mr. Riley, you're on. Ranking Member Markey, members of the committee, it is a privilege and honor for us to appear before you, as it has been for us to serve on this commission, particularly for me to serve with my distinguished friend and longtime, longtime friend and colleague, Bob Graham. I will um, make a brief statement and ask that my testimony be included in the record. I want to begin by saying that uh, with respect to oil and gas, we need the resource. It's vital to the economy, to our mobility, to our way of life. It is itself, the oil and gas industry, a significant contributor to productivity, to jobs, to our um, GDP, and to uh, avoiding uh, even more uh, necessity to import uh, international, from the international oil market. This commission uh, believes that we can develop offshore oil and gas resources safely. We can um, do it in the deep water, and I would signal that the deep water is where it is. That's where the industry has been going and will be going in an even more significant way in the years to come. But the con country's confidence in offshore oil and gas development has been shattered. The commission determined that the Government and industry both were characterized by an aura of complacency. That has attracted a good deal of attention and some criticism. I would just say very briefly that when you have, as I learned from Tony Hayward, the CEO of BP, the week after I took office as commission co-chairman, 
when you learn from him that there is effectively no subsea containment technology or capability, when you look at response plans that talk about protecting walruses in the Gulf of Mexico, when you see the wholly inadequate response technology that has not evolved since I oversaw it 20 years before in Prince William Sound, and when you see that there have been 79 instances of loss of well control between 1996 and 2009 in the Gulf, and that we have, as was mentioned, a fatality rate that is five times that of the North Sea, a much more punishing environment. And then finally, that you have, you have key omnipresent contractors which are deeply implicated in the bad decisions that contributed to the high risk that we uncovered. You have to conclude both that there was an aura of complacency, and so many industry leaders have said, which I would have said myself, is we didn't think this was possible. We didn't think this could happen. But also that contractors who have supplied faulty cement to a BP rig or who have failed to detect gas rising in the drill pipe on a BP rig um, it is inconceivable, given their presence in all the oceans of the world where oil and gas are developed, it is inconceivable to us that uh, this would only have been confined to one company, to a rogue company, which was my own conviction, my own premise, starting, starting out. So we did conclude this is a systemic problem. It has been characterized by an atmosphere of complacency. I want to signal... Um, one more thing, and that is the history of the budget of the government regulatory agency on which we're quite hard. We're quite critical of its effectiveness, its capability, its lack of professionalism to carry out the, in, the assignment that the law gives it to monitor and control and regulate this industry. The budget for MMS, the predecessor to BOEMRE, has gone down 20% since 1984, while offshore oil and gas production has tripled. So to address these issues, we have three principal proposals. First is for a safety authority within the Interior Department entirely walled off from political interference with a, with a director appointed for a term, much like the FBI director, and adequately resourced and, and budgeted, provided for. We recommend that industry establish a safety institute. The high-risk industries that have had catastrophes have learned from them. The chemical industry after Bhopal with responsible care the um, nuclear industry after Three Mile Island with the Institute for Nuclear Power Operations. Those should be focused on best practice and should bring up the game of everybody and allow the best companies to have some means of ensuring that one laggard company, one bad performer, does not bring everybody down and cause all their rigs to be shut down in the Gulf, as was, as was the case last summer. Finally, I just want to signal the international dimensions of our issue. If you look at a map of the Gulf of Mexico, the United States has sovereign jurisdiction over far less than all of it. Uh, we now know Mexico intends to go into deep water in two years, Cuba within the next year or two, and we need some kind of international understanding or treaty with respect to the standards that will apply to those activities. We also need it in the Arctic, where Russia is, intended to, is intending to go into its Arctic waters with BP and Rosneft, Canada, Denmark's already begun in Greenland last summer. Um, we need the same kind of attention on the part of our State Department to ensure that uh, the Arctic waters are given the kind of special protection that they deserve. We make a number of recommendations particularly relevant to science and the science that is needed to pursue oil and gas development in those, in those very different waters with all of the high risk that uh, special storm action fog and uh, deep cold entail. Well, those are the, some of the principal recommendations I wanted to cover, Mr. Chairman. I would only say that um, uh, they are relatively modest, in my view, in terms both of money, certainly in terms of bureaucracy and uh, disruption. To reorganize the Interior Department will not take much in the way of money. To budget adequately the uh, BOEMRE uh, will take some, but it's relatively small in view of both the huge costs of the accident we just experienced and the overall revenues that the United States receives from offshore oil and gas development leases and royalties. I think it's, uh, it's money that would be well invested. 
and we look forward to your questions and um, recognize that from the point of view of the commission, we're just about done. So it really is over to you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, uh, Mr. I very pr appreciate very much your testimony. Senator Graham, you are on. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Markey, and the other members of this <coughs> committee. And I know many of you are. You press the uh, microphone, Senator Graham, there. I know many of you are commencing your service in Congress, and let me extend my congratulations. Uh, you are beginning a journey which will have uh, immense uh, gratification uh, and personal uh, pleasure. So I congratulate you and wish you well in your service. Mr. Chairman, uh, our commission was established in May of last year. We were given three responsibilities. First was to determine the cause of the Deepwater Horizon explosion. Second, to evaluate the response uh, to that disaster. And third, to advise the nation about future energy exploration, particularly in the offshore environment. January 11th, we submitted our report uh, called Deepwater, the future of oil disaster, the Gulf oil disaster and the future of offshore uh, drilling. Uh, we uh, had been initially subject to some criticism. Uh, one was that we lacked independence. Uh, in the course of our investigation, we were able to make just about everybody mad at us. Uh, from time to time, the industry was mad, the White House uh, was mad. I, maybe this committee escaped that. Uh, I believe we established the fact that we were looking at this uh, from this perspective of the American people's interest and none other. Uh, second, there was some criticism that we weren't competent to carry out this task. Uh, it would be immodest to try to defend our competency. I would just submit our report, its findings and recommendations, and you can evaluate whether uh, you think that we had the skills, uh, both among the seven commissioners uh, and in a, an excellent staff led by uh, Mr. Richard Lazarus, uh, who gave us a tremendous support uh, throughout this endeavor. Uh, I'd like to make one general comment before I turn to the two areas that I'm particularly going to discuss, and that is that there is a difference uh, in the offshore of the Gulf from what we have know well, which is the onshore oil and gas production. Onshore oil and gas production is a combination of drilling on privately owned land and public land. All of the drilling in the Gulf of Mexico is on publicly owned land land which belongs to the people of the United States of America. So I think the way to look at this is not just as a regulator, a government regulating a private enterprise going about its private business. We also are in the role of a landlord. Uh, we have an obligation to protect this asset that belongs to all the people of America and to be able to continue uh, to draw upon it for a variety of purposes. Yes, energy, but also it's a major source of American seafood, uh, and it is one of our major uh, tourist areas, just to mention three of the benefits that we derive from the Gulf. So are we fulfilling our responsibility to be a prudent landlord? Uh, I'm going to discuss the area of response and containment, uh, and then uh, the issue of where do we go from here in terms of restoration of the Gulf. My good friend uh, Bill Riley has already mentioned that the response uh, to this event was, to say the least, very disappointing. Uh, although there was VP, nor the federal government was prepared to conduct an effective response. There was a failure to plan in advance for such an event, a failure to coordinate, particularly uh, between federal agencies and state and local officials. In addition, neither the industry nor the federal government had invested in the research to understand in an anticipatory way what we would be facing if we had uh, such a, an event as the Macondo blowout. Um, much of the technology 
that we were able to bring to this problem was the same technology that had been used 20 years earlier in the Exxon Valdez, which is to say there was almost no technological advances taken as a result of the experience of Exxon Valdez. We've made a number of recommendations on response and containment, including that the Department of Interior, in consultation with other agencies, should develop a more rigorous set of requirements for industry response plans. No more polar bears or walruses in the response plans for the Gulf of Mexico. That EPA and the Coast Guard should involve state and local governments as significant players. That Congress should provide adequate and sustained funding for oil spill, including and particularly research into how to mitigate oil spills. And the industry should fund a private organization to develop, adopt, and enforce standards of excellence to assure continuous improvement in the technology for oil spill response. The second uh, area uh, is restoration. The day before this event was April 19, 2010. If we define our goal as being to restore the Gulf to the condition that it was in on April 19th, we have missed an enormous opportunity. Frankly, the Gulf on April 19th was a degraded uh, area. Uh, it had suffered for decades of misuse uh, and the most dramatically shown by the marshes of Louisiana, which have been receding at a rate of over one football field every 30 minutes. Uh, we felt that this was a chance to begin a major process of restoring this very important part of our nation. We have recommended that 80 percent of the fines and penalties that we anticipate will be assessed under the Clean Water Act be directed at Gulf restoration. That will require your approval. Only Congress uh, can make that commitment uh, of those fines and penalties. But we believe that it would be money well spent. Uh, we recognize uh, that uh, it will require uh, a significant amount of time, probably in the range of 20 to 30 years, to complete an effective restoration. Uh, we believe that th these funds would be the basis of a major down payment uh, towards that objective. I'd like to conclude my remarks, and I got the signal, Mr. Chairman, uh, <laughs> that uh, drilling is inherently risky. We can never reduce it to zero, but we believe the steps that we've recommended will substantially reduce the probabilities of a repeat of Macondo, and should that happen, will significantly enhance our capacity to restrain its consequences. Mr. Chairman, I will submit my full report. I appreciate your willingness to receive it. I look forward to responding to your questions. Uh, thank you very much, and thank uh, both of you. For, for the record, it was not me that cleared my throat that you responded to. <laughs> but nevertheless, I, uh, I appreciate that. And I, and I, did, uh, I, I did allow, I did want uh, both of you to finish your remarks, and I, I allowed that. Uh, but we do want to try to stay as closely as we can. I, I just have uh, an observation and a, and a question that I uh, want to ask both of you. Right from the get-go, when this event happened and uh, I was asked to respond, I said something on the order, number one, we need to stop the leak, number two, we need to hold BP accountable, and number three, we need to make sure that uh, the restoration can get that part of the country back to nor normalcy, however you describe that. And I've been saying that right from, absolutely from day one. Uh, you have spent a great deal of time uh, on your, uh, in your report. Uh, both of your testimony talked about what should be done in the future. And I alluded to this in my opening statement, and I'd like you to both to respond to it. We still don't know what caused the explosion, unless I missed something. And we don't know how or why the BOP malfunctioned, if that was the case. And I'd like both of you to respond to that. And is there maybe a time in the future when you're going to answer that, or do we wait for 
we wait for other uh, reports to come in before we draw a conclusion. So, Mr. Whoever wants to go first, I'd like uh, both of you to respond to that. Well, what we know is that uh, the event occurred, uh, and we know a great deal about why the event occurred. Uh, we've identified in our report nine instances, nine human decisions that were made in the hours uh, before uh, the Macondo explosion, uh, which we think were the precipitating uh, cause of this immediate event. It is true uh, that uh, no one at this point has had the benefit of the full forensic examination of the blowout preventer. It is at a NASA facility in New Orleans uh, being closely examined. Uh, but w what we do know uh, is that it didn't perform as it should have. Uh, whether if it had been able to perform uh, at an optimum level, it's questionable whether that would have avoided the explosion because the gas had already gotten beyond uh, the blowout preventer uh, at the time that uh, the, uh, it would have gone into effect. Uh, so I believe that uh, our report uh, adequately, accurately, comprehensively addresses both the immediate cause and then the context in which that occurred, which was a long period in which government uh, had done a, a very inadequate job of regulation, uh, in which the industry had fallen in uh, to this culture of uh, complacency, uh, and uh, where the consequences uh, have been an enormous economic uh, and environmental cost to the people of the United States. I would just add, Mr. Chairman, we know enough. We know what happened. We know that, um, that uh, in a negative pressure test, which was supposed to determine whether a cementing had effectively sealed off the well, we know that uh, inconsistent information came from the kill line and the drill pipe. And the good news was accepted. Uh, while the conflicting information was rejected in the drill pipe itself, indicating that there had not been a seal, the cementing had failed. We know that. We know that as gas did rise in the drill pipe, uh, it was not noticed. Although we have the documentation of the instrumentation, the record that should have been recognized by a professional monitoring that instrumentation to indicate gas was coming up the riser. It was not recognized uh, it, until it was too late. So we know those things. Those are a couple of, of examples. Um, a number of decisions were made by people who are not alive, and um, we cannot uh, but speculate on how they came to make some of those decisions or to have missed some of the information that they did have. And if you look at page um, 125 of our report, we list about nine decisions, seven of which had the corollary benefit of saving time. Uh, no doubt they were identified as more efficient ways to proceed, but uh, there were alternatives to most of them, and they weren't chosen. So these were th the immediate, the proximate cause was a series of bad decisions, very hard to understand decisions, on the uh, day of April 20th and leading up to it with respect to uh, Halliburton's supply of cement, which failed three of its own tests and nine tests that were subjected to by our commission, uh, by uh, Chevron's laboratory for testing cement. Um, so we do know those things, and uh, I would, uh, well, I would be I, quite confident that we're, we've established the facts here. Since my time is running out, I will, just, I will just make this observation, because what you have alluded to, both of you, is the fact that somewhere along the line there is human error, something wasn't read. Uh, we heard that in testimony, frankly, from the industry when they were here mm -hmm. uh, shortly after. Uh, they said, we don't know what happened but we suspect that this is going to be the case. And, mm -hmm. and that you have confirmed, but we still don't know what mechanically or whatever else broke down. And I just wanted to, I, I thank you for responding to that. Uh, Mr. Markey. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, very much. Uh, thank you for this report. This report is a blistering, scalding indictment of the practices engaged in by the industry and by regulators. Uh, that created the conditions that made this accident possible. My question to you is, um, if your recommendations are not adopted, are, recommenda are, are provisions similar to those which you recommend, do you think we run the risk of repeating that catastrophe once again in the waters 
of the United States. Yes, as I said, even if all of the recommendations were adopted, uh, no one could issue an insurance policy that there would be no repetition. Uh, but I, I could issue an insurance policy that the likelihood of a repetition and the consequence of the repetition will be significantly less uh, if these recommendations are adopted. Uh, one of the things that characterizes these recommendations is they're not from, from outer space. Most of them are from the North Sea, a place which has a more punishing environment than the Gulf of Mexico, yet has uh, a dramatically different record in terms of fatalities. Uh, we believe that some of the experience there, uh, and ironically, the same companies that are operating in the Gulf are operating under those standards in the North Sea. So it is not a, a mystery or a, a new uh, set of uh, standards for those companies themselves. Uh, and uh, as I said in my report, I, uh, I am uh, concerned that if we don't act, if we're timorous, uh, and if we have uh, an enhanced likelihood of a, an event similar to the Macondo, that we are all going to be pointed at as to why uh, we were unable to recognize and why we were unwilling uh, to act uh, in the public interest. Um, do you agree, Minister Riley? I do agree. And I, I would add that this is a very dynamic industry which has transformed itself in the last 25 years as it's moved from shallow water into deep water, which is a much more high risky environment. It's uh, not. Uh, adapted its own risk protections, its management systems adequately to either prevent or to respond to a problem of this sort. And I'll tell you one of the things that, uh, well, it is reassuring that, that BOEMRE has issued new prescriptive regulations to try to govern a lot of the activities that would take place in the future, and that gives us some encouragement. Frankly speaking, we don't consider that uh, agency as it is now staffed, formed, trained, and compensated mm -hmm. adequate to the ta task mm -hmm. that they have, and that if it's not strengthened, I suspect that we will again see an incongruity glow between the uh, sophistication of the industry and its dynamism and the failure of inspectors even to understand some of the basic technologies to stay on top of it. Well, let me follow up on that then, because you have recommendations here that can be implemented administratively. Uh, by the Obama administration, but there are other recommendations here that really need congressional action so, mm -hmm. so that we change the laws. Um, do you think it would be wise for us not to act legislatively to give that authority uh, to the government so that they can change business as usual? Uh, would we be running a risk if we did not pass legislation? I think you'd be running a big risk. There are two crucial moves that I believe the Congress has to take. One is to reorganize the Interior Department, simply to ensure that leasing revenue concerns of the sort that animated the agency over several administrations and three MMS directors testified to before our commission, that those no longer infect safety and environment regulation. And the way to do that is statutorily, the way to do it on any kind of sustainable basis, by creating a walled-off regulator within the Department of the Interior with a term appointment for the director. And the second, the second requirement, and the first doesn't cost anything, the second requirement is to adequately fund BOMRE to carry out the responsibilities that it has. Thank you. You know, just to note here, BP had 760 OSHA fines versus one for ExxonMobil. Um, so that we can understand that there's something fundamentally wrong here that a company like that was allowed to continue to operate. Uh, Senator Graham, what your recommendation on legislation? Well, I would agree uh, with uh, those two points. And then the third is the one I made relative to restoration, that only Congress can designate a portion of these fines and penalties for the specific purpose of restoration, uh, which we think in terms of the national interest in this uh, region of America, the, the fact that many of the uh, problems that have led to the degradation of the uh, Gulf of Mexico uh, had the federal government at least as a partner, if not the primary uh, indicted uh, figure. And just can I just say very quickly, some people say, well, it's just BP and that the other actors didn't play a role. 
including the government in it, that the other companies didn't play a role. Well, true it wasn't or not just, true? It was, in the area of response, it was not just BP that was incapable. If this same thing had happened on virtually any of the rigs in the Gulf, uh, we would have had the same response because uh, we had the inadequate, unplanned uh, for uh, capabilities that uh, uh, made this such a unnecessarily significant uh, impact on the economy and the environment of the Gulf of Mexico. Thank you I both for your service. Thank the, uh, thank the gentleman. Uh, Mr. Young of Alaska. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank the witnesses. And uh, I, Mr. Chairman, I, I reviewed the report and I've also reviewed the members of the Commission. And I have statements from every one of the members of the Commission that do not support offshore drilling, including the two witnesses before us. And that concerns me because I can't figure out how this can be a report that was supposed to look for the cause is now trying to ask us to pass legislation when their basic goal is against offshore development. In your statement, you said you were for it, you know the importance. But one gentleman said, we can establish 75 years of the gold for independence. To meet that goal, we'd have to reduce domestic production, not increase it. Uh, I'm just questioning the commission and the sincerity of really seeking a solution to a needed commodity, which is oil. Now, I personally have another question because of this administration. Um, hmm. From either one of you, from the technical perspective, what makes drilling in the deep water of Gulf of Mexico so different? And are these conditions typical of other areas of the U.S. OCS? What's different between the Gulf and Alaska? Well, the difference between the Gulf and Alaska is uh, the deep water that we're involved with in the Gulf. Uh, 5,000, we're going to 10,000 feet. Three rigs have been commissioned that will take that us That I know, to and I feet. appreciate your answer. But, I appreciate your answer. But well, I thought that as I, was a as, I as I read your, your, your report, your position on Arctic drilling with the President is, in fact, we have to step forward with caution. We have to make sure it can't be done too rapidly, et cetera, et cetera. But it's 150 feet versus 2,000 some odd feet, or excuse me, 20,000 feet, 18,000 feet. And I'm worried about this country. We're going to spend about $400 billion again to buy our oil. And this commission, make up of this commission, they're all against the development of offshore drilling. And onshore, by the way. Some of the commission voted against opening Anwar. 39 billion barrels with 74 miles from a pipeline. We are facing bankruptcy because we have not been able to develop our fossil fuels. And yet the commission, the majority of them, in fact all of them, are in it intent is not to have fossil fuels. And I think that's inappropriate. Now, lastly, if I can suggest one thing, Mr. Chairman, we did have drilled in the Gulf about 42,000 wells, including 2,500 deep water wells. And nowhere do you report in your report or suggest why that was successful. We've had one big spill since Santa Barbara. Now, how do you answer that? Was there any credit given for what was done before and for those that did it? Question, answer. Well, I referred to 79 losses of well control. I think uh, many of those contributed to uh, accidents and several contributed to fatalities. That is the record that we have for the Gulf and it's uh, how many not, spills? not a pretty one. How many spills? I don't know how many spills were associated with those, but if you look at that list in the report, uh, if they weren't spills, they were near misses and close calls and enough to kill people, and they were Just fires. Just like driving down the street, slipping on the ice. On, I'd like to... Be careful. Say, say it again with respect to ice. Just like driving down the street, slipping on ice. There's going to be a chance. There is no fail-safe way to do anything. No, and it as can Senator, be done better. As Senator Graham said, you cannot reduce, you cannot eliminate risk. You can reduce it significantly. I would point out to you, uh, Mr. Young, that uh, first of all, 
when you, when you say what we really believe, what we really believe is in this report, and we're what pretty I detailed, and I think we, we have a lot of authority and documentation behind the recommendations and findings that are in here. So I'd, I actually uh, would, would suggest that uh, instead of interpreting comments made uh, by commissioners perhaps in an earlier time without this mission, you look at this as a definitive record of what, where we really stand. And we're for offshore oil and gas development. We think it can be done safely. And we also specifically recommend against a moratorium in Alaska in the Arctic. And that means that you, in fact, want us to go forth? Yes, sir. And you, this commission you, believes will, will that you we... you express that in your report? It this, doesn't say that. This commission believes that we can go forward to drill in, in the offshore, in the Chukchi and Beaufort Seas, but it recommends a series of scientific analyses of um, Coast Guard search and rescue movement, of a range of activities that will have to be supplied either by government or the industry to ensure over the long term it will done, be done safely. But we don't recommend that that, and we specifically say that should not be a barrier to moving forward. It does say then you're supporting Arctic drilling. Yes, sir. In the, in the report. Yes, sir. I didn't read that. And I, if you do so, I wish you were well, giving well, you, the president. You, you, said, you said in your remarks that uh, we recommend that it be done with caution. And that is certainly true, and we think that it's a distinctive set of challenges that are presented there. That's what happens, though. We have the studies for 40 years we've been drilling in the Arctic. Just not Prudhoe Bay. We've been drilling there when we had the uh, uh, PET-4, when we had the, uh, the dew line operation. We've been doing the drilling, and we've done the studying. We've done the work. And all of a sudden now we have that moratorium in place by someone that doesn't believe in fossil fuel. You heard him last night on the floor. He doesn't believe in fossil fuels. And I think it's wrong for this country. I want all forms of power. But all of a sudden, we've got a commission report. I don't believe it really suggests we can do it without a big, long delay. But we'll send the money overseas. Mr. Chairman, my time is up. Yep. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Uh, Malone from New Jersey. Mr. Malone. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman Hastings and, and uh, Ranking Member Markey for, for having the hearing today. Um, the report in front of us today is, is clear, in my opinion, that we cannot drill safely off our shores under the current system and that our coastal communities need protection from untrustworthy big oil. Only big oil would claim that they can drill safely and look to expand drilling in the wake of our country's worst environmental disaster and the finding of their systematic failures. Now, since the Deepwater Horizon disaster, the President has reversed course and thankfully taking drilling in the Atlantic off the table, at least for the next five years. And I commend him for that action and believe we must make that policy permanent. Only then can we be safe from the greed of the oil industry. Also, House Democrats passed the CLEAR Act to prevent another catastrophic spill, and at that time, my Republican colleagues opposed the legislation, saying we needed to wait for this Commission's report. Now that we have it, it's time to take action to prevent big oil from wreaking havoc on our environment. And that's why I introduced the No New Drilling Act to prevent the expansion of offshore drilling, which I believe must be the policy, at least until we can be certain another Deepwater Horizon incident will not happen again. Um, I represent a district along the Jersey Shore. I live along the Jersey Shore as well, have all my life. And one of the things that I wanted to ask the two members, uh, I'm the two members of the panel, is that I believe very strongly that the further you go out and the deeper you are, uh, the more dangerous it becomes. Um, in arguing against the need for reform, the oil and gas industry likes to make the argument that the BP spill was like an outlier, and they point to the long history of drilling in the Gulf. But in reality, isn't it true that the vast majority of the oil and gas industry's offshore drilling in the Gulf has been in shallow water, where drilling is much less complicated than in the ultra deep water where the deep water horizon was operating. And so basically, as we go further out, and, and certainly my understanding is the Atlantic is strictly deep water, not in shallow water, that um, the danger is greater. And that's even more, one more reason why what your recommendations uh, that you've put forth are crucial. I'll, I'll ask either of you if you could answer that question. Well, the answer is clearly there is a relationship between the danger and risk the deeper uh, you go. Uh, and it is also true that up until about 1990, uh, virtually all 
of the drilling that had ever taken place in the Gulf of Mexico was in waters of less than 1,000 feet, which are, is the definition of shallow drilling. Uh, so the, the circumstances have dramatically changed. And at the same time that the industry was developing a technology that can, frankly, only be analogized to the technology of the space program and its sophistication, uh, there was an enormous burst of the offensive capability to drill in deeper areas. There was not a commensurate increase in the defensive capability to respond should there be an accident and to create the safety environment that would reduce the prospects, not to zero, but to the degree possible uh, that there would not be uh, accidents. Uh, on, in the materials that have been distributed, there is a chart uh, which is called MMS Budget and Gulf of Mexico Crude Oil Production, uh, 1984 to 2009. It's on page 73 of our report. And you can see the degree to which the production in the Gulf of Mexico uh, has gone from being shallow water production uh, now not only to deep water, but the greatest increase has been in what's described as ultra uh, deep water, uh, where the, the risks are even more uh, significant. Mr. Riley, did you want to respond? No, I think the. Uh, well, just, to, just to say that, uh, to reinforce what Senator Graham said, that the, the formations are uh, deeper in the deep water. That is, they are well under even very often. The, um, the, certainly the case of Macondo, they were down at 18,000 feet, uh, which is 13,000 feet below the mud, mud level. Um, the formations are under much greater pressure, uh, with the, um, something up in the range of 30,000 pounds per square inch. Uh, which means uh, all sorts of things in terms of the complexity of dealing with a, uh, a well situation that um, yeah, also involves, of course, robots, which are the only way you can actually monitor and maintain and, 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 and improve or uh, repair uh, technology down at that level. So for all of these reasons, it's a much more challenging uh, enterprise. And um, uh, that's why uh, the industry, in our view, needs to improve its capacity recognize that they are in a different era from the one that characterized shallow water drilling and uh, establish the kind of safety institute we recommend. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, Mr. Lamborn for Colorado. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I want to thank both of the distinguished witnesses for being here today and giving your testimony. You said earlier that you do not know why the blowout preventer did not work. And I'm very concerned that you didn't even wait until you knew what the cause of it not working was before issuing your report. Why didn't you wait until we know, knew why that blowout preventer didn't even work? Because well, that's a key element in this whole chain of events. Yes, sir. This uh, was clear from the start. When the president created us with an executive order, he gave us a timetable of six months. And in our early conversation with him, we made clear to him we didn't expect the blowout preventer to be pulled up before uh, late August, which is about, I think, when it was taken up, and it still hasn't been forensically analyzed. So it was always understood that the blowout preventer would not be part of our report. We would not have access to it and not be able to make any judgments about it. But the failure of the blowout to a preventer to work uh, is itself known as to specifically why it didn't work. That remains to be seen. I think uh, all other aspects of this bill, though, were subject to our investigatory uh, uh, analysis. And um, we were able to make the judgments that, that give us confidence that we know what happened. Well, thanks for that answer. But I think you or the president should have had the patience to know why it didn't work. And your report would have been much more significant, in my opinion, had we had that information. Well, as commissioners, we, we sir, didn't have that, uh, okay. didn't have that option. Uh, secondly, in a Wall Street Journal editorial from two weeks ago, it states that not a single member of your commission was a drilling engineer or an expert in oil exploration technology or practices. Don't you think that the commission would have been improved had you had people with that kind of expert background on your board? Yeah, frankly, uh, I think that was a relevant question to ask uh, in the summer of 2010. Today, we've submitted an almost 400-page report. We would like our competence to be judged on this report. Uh, and if there are areas that you think demonstrate a 
a lack of, uh, of capacity to make the judgments that we did, we would be pleased to know what those are and we would attempt to provide a response or an, or an admission of our naivete. Uh, I would uh, uh, say that I believe even if, if you took the most extreme explanation of why the blowout uh, preventer failed to function, that doesn't trump the other nine factors that we've identified uh, that, uh, that were contributing causes to this. So while I'd, I'm curious to know what the uh, BOP did, uh, I don't think it would change the findings uh, or the recommendations that we have made in this report. We certainly would not uh, withdraw our recommendation that the oil and gas industry should adopt as the nuclear power industry has some form of, of internal capability to assess safety. We would not change our position that we need to have an effective, competent federal uh, agency that can oversee the industry. We would not change our recommendation that that agency should be protected by independence within the Department of Interior. Those are our key uh, safety recommendations. Uh, and I don't think there's any evidence that's going to come from the forensic examination uh, that's currently going on at a NASA facility in New Orleans of the blowout preventer that would alter those recommendations. Well, okay, I'll move on to my uh, next question here. Um, in its undertaking uh, of the investigation of the Deepwater Horizon incident, the National Academy of Engineering and the National Research Council announced that they would not be issuing their final report until it has been peer-reviewed, which is their standard practice for reports issued by the National Academies. Has your report been submitted for peer review to any other kind of body or experts or? Well, it's a public document, so it's not just submitted to peers, it's submitted uh, to the American people for their comment and evaluation. I would, I would just say that it's been pretty well reviewed reviewed and, um, and pretty well received and commented on by experts in the field. When, and I also want to note that we say in our formal testimony that our senior technology and science advisor on this uh, enterprise was, was Richard Sears, who has 33 years of experience, senior experience with Shell Oil. He was present to all of our deliberations on the technology. And I'd also like to acknowledge publicly we had strong cooperation from industry, from three companies in particular that spent several hours with us, uh, Chevron, Shell, and ExxonMobil. And um, cooperation, obviously, from the departments of the government, from BOMRE and uh, Mr. Bromwich and Secretary Salazar. So I think we had a full range of input and plenty of opportunity on the part also of the scientific agencies, NOAA, the Coast Guard, to um, ensure that what we say is grounded in good science and respectable technology. And I don't think so far, and I must say, we, we've become a little impatient, uh, Bob and I, with the criticisms of our, of our competence or the credentials of our commissioners, uh, which maybe was okay to raise six months ago, but, but the proof is here. If, if there's something wrong or if there are people who have objections to the findings or think they're wrong, or, uh, or to the recommendations, we would be very happy to debate on that point. But it seems to me it, now a little churlish to, um, to refer back to the credentials without saying in some way how they're connected to the inadequacies in the report, which nobody seems to be doing. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Grijalva from Arizona. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, gentlemen, if I, the current offshore policy is is based on some, some several assumptions as I understand it. Uh, one was that the blowout preventers actually worked. That was an assumption. The assumption was that the industry had the ability to contain spills. The assumptions were that spills offshore won't ever hit onshore. There was an assumption based that rigs are operated as safely as possible. And as I read through your report, uh, it brought into question those assumptions. And uh, so as a result, and just for, for both of you gentlemen, uh, don't we have to rewrite uh, our offshore policy based on the fact that uh, we don't have assumptions we can make right now? And just 
Senator? Well, I think uh, some of the assumptions are that uh, uh, drilling in the offshore is going to be a continuing and increasing uh, part of America's energy supply. Uh, number two, uh, that uh, uh, its acceptability to the American people uh, will be closely aligned with its safety. You may recall that when Three Mile Island uh, yep. blew, uh, almost 25 percent of America's electricity was coming from nuclear power, and there was an expectation that that percentage was going to grow, maybe even to where France is, which is over 70 percent. But that one incident yep. so chilled the public uh, towards nuclear power that we've had effectively a 30-year hiatus of any expansion, and therefore the percentage of electricity from nuclear power is dramatically less than it was 30 years ago. Now, whether the continued activities in the Gulf, uh, more Macondos could have the same effect uh, as Three Mile Island, as a singular event had on the nuclear power industry, we can all speculate. But I think it's in everybody's interest that we conduct this industry uh, to the highest standards. Would anyone answer the question, why should drilling for offshore oil in the Gulf of Mexico be at a lower standard of safety and environmental protection than it is in the North Sea? If there's some explanation as a matter of public policy why we should accept a lower standard, then I think we could have a very, uh, a very good debate. No one has come forward making that uh, assertion. The other point I think you called the, the liability cap arbitrary in the report. Uh, the question is uh, lifting the cap entirely uh, as, as a means to assure that the taxpayer uh, doesn't get stuck with any bill beyond the cap, and two, uh, as an incentive to meet the highest standards that the Senator uh, just mentioned for, for drilling. Any, any reaction to, to no cap at all on liability? We, we have uh, recommended that the cap be lifted. We did not go beyond uh, that. Clearly, the $75 million cap, which is now 21 years old, just the sheer change in the value of money as a result of uh, inflation over 21 years would cause you to believe that $75 million was not adequate. Second, uh, as uh, Bill was pointed out, uh, when that cap was established, virtually all of our offshore drilling was in known, uh, comparatively safe, low-pressure areas, and today the largest share of our drilling is in uh, much riskier, deeper water. Uh, now, now, I'm now going beyond what the Commission recommended and just saying my own feeling is that if we have liability caps, the rationale is to maintain a competitive marketplace uh, in the Gulf of Mexico, that we don't want only uh, the largest oil companies in the world to be able to, to drill. Uh, but we also don't want to have financially uh, in, uh, incapable companies causing enormous uh, consequences. So that, that would lead me to, to feel that the Congress might be able to fashion a policy built around liability limits in relationship to risk. It's one thing to have a liability limit, okay. limit for 100 feet of water than 18,000 uh, feet of water. Today, the law is, applies the same standard to both of those two uh, cases. I would just add, if I might, Congressman, that, that uh, the establishment of some kind of liability cap that both ensures a continuing capacity of independence to operate in the Gulf that doesn't just restrict uh, leasing or bidding to a few majors, but also protects the public against being handed a bill for major damages caused is something that's going to take more time than we had in the six months and probably more involvement of the insurance industry since I assume an insurance consortium of some sort would be necessary to address this. And I also would note that the liability cap in Canada is $35 million. I think it's 50 million pounds in, in Britain. And it does strike me, too, that particularly with respect to those resources 
such as the Gulf and the Arctic, where other countries' activities are also involved, there might be some merit in trying to work out a uniform system of uh, liability which applies uh, systematically as to, uh, to, to all oil and gas development in these areas. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Mr. Fleming from Louisiana. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, uh, panel members, for being here today and your service. Um, this was no question about a, dis a disaster. And like any disaster, even though we don't know the precise cause of the blowout, we do know some things happen that are typical of disasters. Uh, because this is a high-risk operation, much like many other things we do, um, travel in space, flying in airplanes. Rarely is one thing the cause of the disaster. It's usually a number of different situations and occurrences and bad decisions that align themselves, which probably over time have occurred, but because of some backup or redundancy, the disaster was prevented. And that can sometimes be a bad thing because what happens is we become, in your words, complacent. If I make a mistake, there's a backup system that will solve that problem for me. And obviously that's something that on the industry side and on the government side we need to, to bear in mind going forward. Uh, but it was a disaster to Louisiana, my home state, in two ways. One, to our ecology, no question about it. But maybe even worse and longer term in jobs. Uh, Louisiana has now lost tens of thousands of jobs because these rigs are so expensive, they have left our shores in some cases and more will come uh, to go to Brazil and Africa and other places. And you know what's interesting is they're going to other parts of the world that have less standards than we do. So I think that's a real issue we need to look at. Now, the president lifted the moratorium and I've been researching this, I can't find one single permit for deep water drilling that's been issued uh, since the lifting of the moratorium, and we don't know when they ever will. So what I'm concerned about, and I, I would, would like to have your reaction to this, um, I see recommendations for more legislation, but I think we need to be careful about just moving the chairs on the deck. Uh, for, for one thing, we're asking NOAA to sign off on on things, and that's a good thing, but is that going to make the permit process even slower and more difficult? Uh, so I'd love to have the reaction from, from both you gentlemen. Uh, is this really going to get us where we need to be, and how is this going to affect the jobs, which are so desperately needed, and finally, the, the price of, ga of gasoline and oil that's going up because of the loss in supply? I would say two things that I, I think uh, I, I would agree with you completely that. Uh, to the degree that we restrict our own domestic production, we are essentially, given our demand on, su demand on supply, um, mm -hmm. intending to get more oil and gas from risky places like the Niger Delta or Venezuela. That's a, a given. And I think we have to take an international um, perspective on the whole issue and also uh, recognize that uh, the environment in those places counts too and it's been very badly abused, particularly in the Niger Delta, some 2,500 accidents over the last 10 years. So that's, that's a perfectly fair point, and I think it, it's one that ought to underlie our approach to many of these questions. With respect to the moratorium itself, Senator Graham and I were, were pretty specific early on. We uh, did not understand it, thought that it was excessive, and considered that uh, a more selective approach that did not penalize those companies with good records, particularly once after they had been after they had been once been inspected, as they all were, in the weeks following the Macondo disaster. Uh, once those the few infractions that were found were corrected for, it struck us that uh, it would have been reasonable to resume uh, drilling at that time. But uh, that has not happened. I would say that going forward, um, to the degree that we continue to understaff, underprepare, underform, underfinance, the regulatory agency, we probably are going to find that it is more reluctant to issue permits, less confident about signing a name to a permit, and uh, less able to get us back into business. Senator, do you have a response? I, I would just add that uh, what uh, Bill said at the end uh, ha happens to be the position of the 
major petroleum companies in Great Britain, that they actually uh, affirmatively support uh, a strong, well-financed, competent regulator uh, as a key part of their ability uh, to do their business. Uh, I believe they are right, and I hope that uh, we will come to the same conclusion as to the right. industry here in the United States. Well, can I get a commitment from you, gentlemen, and, and Mr. Raleigh's already suggested it, that the President not only lift the official moratorium, but actually allow permits, take a, do away with what we have now, which is a de facto moratorium. Would you both agree that the President should move forward and begin to allow the issuance of permits? Well, as I understand it, and in fact there's a news story uh, today uh, that the the or at least a primary reason for the delay uh, in issuing permits for those rigs that have met uh, the individual uh, standards rig by rig is that the industry has not demonstrated that it has the capability uh, to respond and contain uh, such an event or if it does, those standards have not yet been incorporated in the permit applications. Uh, if that's the case, that actually, in my judgment, is a positive signal that we're now down to essentially one issue. Uh, and there also is some indication that the ability to meet that standard of adequate response and containment uh, is uh, near at hand. Thanks, gentlemen. Thank uh, Mr. Boren, Oklahoma. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I uh, want to thank uh, the members of the Commission for being here today and for your work. Uh, thank you, Mr. Riley, Senator Graham. Uh, it was mentioned earlier that there was some question about the qualifications of the Commission. I want to say um, that I have a high regard for the members of the Commission. Uh, Senator Graham, I, Chairman Graham of the Intelligence Committee, you and my father were chair of the Intelligence Committee about the same time, and we have a warm regard for you and, and your work. Uh, so I want to uh, thank you for your service. Uh, I want to touch on a couple of things uh, that were, uh, you know, in this in this uh, book that we have here before us. Uh, I think a vast majority of the recommendations, actually, a, a lot of the industry would say they don't really have a problem with. And and you know, you're talking to uh, listening to someone who's a big supporter of the oil and gas industry coming from Oklahoma. Uh, but there was some of the verbiage, sometimes even just the words, uh, just to pick out of the report, I, I kind of have some concerns about. One was the, the use of the term systemic, uh, that there are these systemic problems in the industry. And if you look at the 30-year history, uh, you, know, uh, you know, over the last 30 years, the history of uh, offshore oil and gas production, uh, there have been some incidents, but I think a major incident uh, is very rare, and if you compare it with, you know, the airline industry or the commuter trade industry or any other industry, the oil and gas industry has done uh, quite a good job. The last few years, uh, we have seen uh, documentaries like Gasland uh, on hydraulic fracturing. Uh, a lot of this uh, that's out there is driven by emotion. It really isn't driven by facts or science, and so. Um, I'm really concerned, the rhetoric even in the State of Union last night about, oh, these oil and gas companies are making all this money, let's throw some more taxes on them. There are a lot of good quality jobs that are created in states like Oklahoma, Louisiana, all across this country, uh, and they want to do the right thing. Uh, they want to do the right thing for the environment, uh, as do most Americans. A couple of questions, uh, really one question I do have about the CLEAR Act. Uh, legislation that was brought out uh, earlier uh, about the cap on liability. And I've got a lot of independent oil and gas producers in Oklahoma uh, that have this question. Uh, we've been talking quite a bit about this, but given such liability requirements, did your staff or the commission ask the insurance industry if any independent operators would be able to obtain an insurance policy under such guidelines or circumstances? And the reason why I ask that question is, I'm worried, and you kind of touched on this earlier with Mr. Grijalva, uh, if we only have one or two companies, U.S. companies that do the drilling, we're going to have the Chinese are going to be the only folks that can drill these wells. I'd like to see, uh, I'm not talking about a mom and pop company, I'm talking about 
you know, Devon Energy is a huge company in Oklahoma, uh, you know, but it's, it's not as large as some of the big majors. Uh, those are, these are, you know, you know thousands of employees, uh, very well capitalized. These are types of companies that could do this drilling uh, without any problem. Uh, are you all worried about that? And did you talk to the insurance industry about uh, whether or not these smaller companies uh, could, in fact, uh, do this? We are worried about it, and it's why we uh, did not select a number with respect to an increase. We said that it should be increased, but we didn't say how much. And we knew that it would require insurance company consultation and advice and help and didn't, frankly, have time to, to get it. So we did not meet with the insurance industry on, uh, on the liability cap, but for all the reasons you, you, you mentioned and our own sense that uh, it is a valued contribution that independent operators make to the economy, to the culture, to the industry in the Gulf, we did not want to make uh, an irresponsible choice without adequate information that, uh, that might in any way inhibit their activities or possibly even cause them to move to other jurisdictions where the liability cap is, uh, is lower even than, than it is in the United States. Mm -hmm. Sarah, so you'd had the same? I, I would agree with that statement. We tried uh, to operate within our areas of competence. Uh, and the, so the specific recommendations we made, uh, we're, we are prepared uh, to defend them where an issue was outside of what we thought was our regional competence, such as the role of insurance companies in determining the liability uh, caps and how the, role, how the role of insurance companies might be a means of, of giving some assurance that we wouldn't be limited to just a handful of companies. We didn't feel competent to uh, comment on that. We did feel that on its face, the 75 million dollar uh, liability cap across the board for activities that are as divergently risky as shallow and ultra deep water needed to be lifted and re-examined. Uh, we, we also were aware that the Congress is going to make that ultimate uh, decision and we did not feel that we had anything I served in the Yale Corporation with him for six years. Um, and I know your district some. I serve on the board of a oil company, who half of which used to be based, headquartered in Bartlesville. And um, senior executives there this are- Is Conoco Phillips? Are yes, we? sir. Okay, great. Are stung by the uh, use of the term systemic. Uh, and yet, perfectly willing to acknowledge they didn't see this coming, weren't prepared for it, didn't think it could happen, and had a response plan which uh, the chairman acknowledged was embarrassing to him because of the, it had the same characteristics as the other response plans. Um, so I would just say we do not by any means intend to disparage the safety or environmental standards of uh, some of our leading iconic uh, oil and gas companies, whether uh, the majors or the independents. But uh, the facts, I think, speak for themselves with respect to this particular disaster, and uh, they led us to report what we did. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yep. Mr. McClintock, California. Well, gentlemen, thank you for being here today. Uh, failed catastrophically. Uh, the Rogers Commission was impaneled. It was filled with technical experts. It painstakingly recovered the wreckage from uh, underneath the uh, ocean. It determined it re reassembled that wreckage. It then determined the precise cause of the disaster, and it then recommended changes so that the space program could move forward. The one thing we know for sure in this disaster was that the blowout preventer failed. And let me ask you quite directly, did you determine why the blowout preventer failed? The answer is no for the reasons that we've given. Did you, did you but, look? Can I, can I finish answering the question? The, uh, well, it was a yes or no. It's a well, yes or no question. The next question the that I have is: is either, It's my time, Senator. Either it's, it's, it's limited, so please, did you even look at the blowout preventer? No. Most of the time we were at work, we would have taken a robot to go down and get us there. Well, uh, let me read you the uh, Wall Street Journal that took you apart for ideological bias, for a lack of expertise, credibility, 
lack of thoroughness. Um, and this is what they said. Uh, unable to name what definitely caused the well failure, the commission resorts to a hodgepodge of speculations. Adding to the confusion, it acknowledges it could find no evidence that BP or its contractors consciously chose a riskier alternative and so forth. The commission didn't even wait to get an autopsy of the failed blowout preventer, and, and again, coming directly from Wall Street Journal, which is rusting on a Louisiana dock. Why should we take your report seriously if you've not even made that modicum of effort to determine the actual cause of the disaster? Well, as uh, Mr. Riley said uh, to an earlier question, uh, we, had a, we had a presidential six months charter. Uh, we knew early on that that charter was going to run out before the forensic examination of the... Did you ask for an extension of your deadline? We did not. So you just participated in a rush to judgment without even looking at the, 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 the cause of the failure that, that created this entire disaster. Well, I would just uh, direct your attention to page 125 of our report, which lists the nine steps that we uh, assessed that contributed and, yeah, and the, the, but, but again, don't you understand, that would be, be like the Rogers Commission issuing its report without looking at any of the wreckage from, the, from the, cementing, the launch vehicle. the cementing failed. The cement job failed to contain the well free from hydrocarbons. We said that. Let, let me that move not to the question. Let me move to the question of, of, of ideological bias, because this is also uh, uh, an indictment uh, uh, in the Wall Street Journal editorial. They said the conclusions of your report were all, quote, all too predictable given the political history of commission members. Former Democratic Senator Bob Graham fought drilling off Florida. William Riley is the former head of the anti-drilling World Wildlife Fund, and Francis Beneke ran the Natural Resources Defense Council, which is opposed to carbon fuels. Not a single member was a drilling expert or engineer or expert in oil exploration technology or practices. Why should we take you seriously? Congressman, I would just say the use of the word predictable is surprising to me because what was predictable in the view of the Wall Street Journal when they wrote their first critical editorial was that we would recommend against future offshore oil and gas development, which we very definitively did not. You are recommending a whole new level of bureaucracy on top of an obviously already failed bureaucracy um, with the obvious aim of indefinitely delaying of, uh, the production of our nation's uh, uh, energy reserves. Um, how much, what is the economic damage uh, caused by this disaster? Do we have a figure on that yet? We know it's in the tens of billions. I have an estimate here of uh, 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 worst case and base case analysis of the economic damage caused by the moratorium, uh, and it runs from 279 billion all the way up to 341 billion dollars. Billion? Billion, I believe. I haven't seen those numbers before, sir. I would only say, with respect to the bureaucracy question, uh, I, I made clear in my opening statement, I think that, and certainly the report goes into detail on this, that reorganization of the Interior Department should be cost-free. We do want to segregate the leasing, the revenue generating and managing functions from the environment and safety regulations. That's a matter of straightforward reorganization. Um, se secondly, the degree to which we add anything is intended to provide more capability, more expertise, more professionalism in an agency that then I would fully expect, based on my own history at the Environmental Protection Agency, of uh, facilitating more confident permitting and a better uh, regulatory oversight of the industry. I don't think that uh, it would work to delay. I think it would work to improve and create more efficiency in the relationship between the regulator and the industry. Mr. Lujan from uh, Mexico. Chairman, thank you very much. And I know this important hearing is going to outline the recommendations to prevent another Deepwater Horizon disaster from happening again, which is why I think we're here. It's not to debate whether one supports or opposes offshore drilling. It's to make sure that we don't let this happen again and that we all understand the roles that we have to play 
to get there. And I want to thank the commission for the work that they did because this was a tough job. And you had a tough set of circumstances with for the work that they did because this was a tough job. And you had a tough set of circumstances with many critics, many of us being those critics as well. And I hope that we truly listen closely to your recommendations and that we see what we can do to find common ground to be able to get to that point. Uh, by the time this committee had convened last year to hear testimony from BP executives, it had already become clear what led to the Deepwater Horizon explosion was the culmination of systemic failures. It was the failure of companies who knowingly refused to implement the necessary safeguards to prevent this disaster. And it was a failure of governmental policies and regulators that did not apply the proper oversight to minimize the risk of the disaster. BP had shown itself to be negligent in safety violations and environmental protections. You know, we should not forget what happened in 2005 with the explosion in Texas and the lives that were lost, 15 people. 200,000 gallons of crude oil in a pipeline that ruptured in northern Alaska. Now, these are real incidents. But what is most significant about the Commission's report is that it reveals the culture of undermining safety standards is not just an issue for BP, but an epidemic failure facing the entire offshore drilling industry. Quoting directly from the report, the blowout was not the product of decisions made by a rogue industry or government officials. Rather, the root causes are systemic and absent significant reform and both industry practices, government policies might, might well recur. The Bipartisan Commission's report only confirms that Congress must take action, do our part to prevent the disasters like this from happening again. During the 111th Congress, this committee put in a lot of work to develop safeguards that would modernize safety and environmental protections for federal offshore leasing programs in the CLEAR Act. Many expressed a, a, an interest to see the report before we, we move forward. We now have that report. And as we hear from witnesses of the Bipartisan Commission today, we have to ask ourselves, what are we going to do? What is our role as Congress to make sure this never happens again? Are we going to sit back and allow a failed system to continue? We cannot turn a blind eye on this issue. The Commission's report clearly outlines that Congress needs to act quickly to protect the safety of people, the welfare and livelihoods of communities, and the habitat of fragile wildlife. Only seven months ago, we saw the horrific images of the explosion that killed workers, the plumes of oil that devastated marine life, local seafood industries, vulnerable wetlands, and the waters of the Gulf. Over 205 million gallons of oil was spilled in the Gulf because of the Deepwater Horizon spill. Let us never forget the people that were impacted or the families who lost so many of their loved ones. It's in everyone's best interest, including industry, to not let this happen again, and to truly understand the responsibility that we all have to do our part to prevent that. Um, the first question I have is a, a yes or no question. We also learned during the spill how woefully underprepared the federal government was to estimate the actual flow rate of oil spewing from the well. In fact, the federal response was initially entirely dependent on misleading flow rate estimates provided by BP, which had every reason to lowball them because we knew that the liability was tied to the calculations on a per barrel basis. The legislation Democrats introduced today creates a permanent scientific group, which includes scientists from the National Laboratories and the Department of Energy, that will maintain expertise needed to estimate flow rates. Is this consistent with your recommendation? It is consistent. Uh, yes, it is. We, can, we determined that uh, the one consequence of the structure of our laws is that the responsible party takes uh, the lead in overseeing response. We want to keep liability fixed there, but one part of it which, should, that sh which government should have an independent capability to carry out is determination of the flow rate. And the USGS uh, director, Marshall McNutt, has now said that uh, will not be an issue next time. And one last question, Mr. Chairman, to get on the record, and we can get this answered later, is the report reveals that the cause of the spill was corporate mismanagement, inadequate government regulation, and a lack of political will to ensure proper oversight of the offshore oil industry as they pushed offshore drilling into deeper waters. You describe in your report that this problem is pervasive across the entire offshore drilling industry. So my question is, what will be the consequences if reforms fail to be prioritized, including the passage of proper legislation to minimize the chances of a disaster like this from happening again. And Mr. Chairman, I know we're running out of time. I want to be respectful of the other members. And so we could ask the witnesses, Senator, uh, to maybe send those back to us, because I think that there's a, a very thoughtful answer that we need as part of that. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yield I, back. I thank the gentleman. Uh, Mr. Fleshman of Tennessee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, gentlemen, thank you for being here today. It's a privilege. 
Um, in addition to serving on this distinguished committee, I also serve on the Small Business Committee. And my first question to you all in this is in this regard. Uh, gentlemen, uh, what would you all say to the owners of the small businesses in this region struggling to survive until operations are restored in the Gulf? Uh, these people have lost uh, most of their revenue streams, if not all of their revenue streams. They've made extraordinary personal and professional sacrifices to retain their employees and to preserve their businesses. Uh, but they cannot hold on indefinitely. Uh, I would like you all to address that, please. Well, of course, what you just described describes a number of the industries that are dependent on the Gulf. Uh, there were thousands of uh, fishermen who lost their ability to uh, acquire their income, and uh, there was a de degradation of the brand of Gulf seafood, 20 to 30 percent drop almost overnight uh, in the consumption of Gulf seafood, which has not yet been overcome. We make some specific rec recommendations on that subject. The tourism industry, which depends upon people's feeling that they're going to go to a place that's clean and healthy and, they will, and enjoyable, uh, it also suffered a tremendous damage. So the consequences of an event like this have rippling effects. Uh, Mr. Riley has described the fact that uh, we believe that, uh, that there needs to be a safe industry, that there can be a safe industry, but that there needs to be an offshore oil industry in order to meet the energy requirements of the United States. Uh, so, and we uh, sympathize for all the small business, whether they be fishermen, restaurant owners, or uh, suppliers to the oil and gas industry. And we hope that we can get back in business as rapidly as possible uh, with the safety measures that will protect all of theirs, those interests. Thank you, Mr. Riley. Congressman, I don't know if you've had this experience, but I, um, I ordered uh, some oysters in New York uh, sometime in September, I think, and asked whether uh, they were from the Gulf and was reassured very confidently by the waitress, no, we would not serve any seafood from the Gulf. Uh, that problem persisted through the fall. I understand it's not entirely disappeared now. People continue, the seafood processors, the fishermen, to suffer because of that. I remember talking to the governor just uh, around Memorial Day, the governor of Mississippi, who told me that uh, there wasn't any oil within 60 miles of the beaches of Mississippi, but uh, there was 30 percent occupancy in what usually is the most important vacation tourism year, a weekend of the year in Mississippi. Those stories uh, and of Europeans canceling trips to Key West, where the oil never approached, uh, are very poignant stories. Uh, Vietnamese fishermen, I think, impressed me more than, more than those of any other. Uh, in my experience when I was in the Gulf. And we had hearings, our first hearing was in New Orleans. We became very familiar with the problems you described. They are as serious as you say. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, I have a follow-up question. In light of the additional fees and proposed taxes on, on industry, uh, what would the total government takeaway be, uh, including royalties, severance taxes, property taxes, income taxes, lease bonuses, and the proposed additional fees and taxes mentioned in the report. I don't think we've costed those, those numbers uh, in total. Uh, the only thing I would say is that it's really important to keep in perspective the amount of revenues the government takes in from offshore oil and gas development, anywhere from six to eight billion dollars in one year up to, I think, 18 billion dollars in 2008. It's the second largest revenue generator after the IRS. And we can afford to spend some very small proportion of that, which be, would be in dollar numbers reasonably significant, ensuring that, um, that it's better done than it's been done by the government. Senator? According to the chart, which appears on page 73 of our report, uh, in the year 1984, the uh, budget of the MMS was approximately $250 million. Uh, and in the year 2009, it was something south of 200. Uh, at the same time, the industry, as the same chart displays, has moved from being a relatively uh, well-known, shallow water uh, industry to increasingly a deep water, high-risk uh, industry. You would have thought that the, the lines of uh, cost of effective regulation would have coincided with the increased uh, risk. Uh, so I can't tell you exactly what the number is, but it, it 
it would be hard to justify uh, a uh, what appears to be about a 60 to 70 million dollar a year reduction uh, in the capability of the regulatory agencies uh, at the time the industry is going into uh, more risky areas. Thank you, Senator. Uh, Dr. Christensen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I want to thank our uh, panelists for being here. Uh, I too want to commend you for the, and the broader way of contr contributors to this very comprehensive report. And among the many co areas of concern, I too have to say that I could never understand why the US permitting standards were lower than other countries and specifically lower than the UK, if I remember correctly, where BP was actually, is actually based. Ours should be the highest in the world. And I just, I also want to support, uh, before I get to my question, Senator Graham's response on the moratorium, because according to my reports, the Department of Interior since June of last year has approved 28 permits to drill offshore in shallow water of 500 feet or less. And there are only four or five shallow water permits currently pending. On the deep water drilling moratorium, uh, the moratorium was lifted on October 12th and gas operators have to comply with new regulations to show that they have a strategy in place to actually contain a blowout. According to the Interior Department, this, thus far no one has been able to demonstrate that actually, although I know that they're working on it, um, and that's the holdup, not the department, but the fact that the companies are not able to respond adequately at this time. On the good side, the good news though is that according to the department, some companies are getting close, as you said, in, to being able to demonstrate that ability. And I do share the majority's hope that this can happen as quickly as possible. I w I'm, my first question, if I can get to two, I, uh, I wanted to follow up on Mr. Boren's question. And in saying that a systemic failure occurred, did you mean a systemic in this case of the three companies and their management of the deep water uh, horizon drilling and MNS? an MMS, or did you mean to apply it um, to the entire industry and, and say that the entire industry w w has been complacent? So I, I just want to understand what you meant by systemic. Well, if we did not mean parity. That is, that all companies were equally uh, subjected to this culture of complacency. In fact, there are some companies that have a, a very strong record. Uh, what we meant to say was that there were evidences that the industry uh, had not responded, A, to the recognition that there were some outlier companies that needed to be sanctioned. You're a medical physician. Uh, if there was a physician in the U.S. Virgin Islands who was known by the other physicians Absolutely. to be performing at a, at a rate that put people's lives at risk, I would assume it would be your professional responsibility to bring Absolutely. that to the attention. Well, uh, we do not feel that the industry carried out its obligation uh, for self-policing and thus, in part, the recommendation for the INPO type organization. Second, uh, the example of response. Response uh, is an industry-wide obligation. We don't expect every company to have all the equipment that's necessary to respond, but we expect the industry writ large to have the capacity to respond. And it was clear that not only was there not that capacity, uh, but that there had been relatively little investment uh, in the technology or research and development, the understanding of the environment that would have put them in a position uh, to have uh, produced a response. Can I just comment on your point about uh, the UK uh, experience? We have discovered in the course of our research that companies and industries get serious about reforming practices and improving them when they have their catastrophe. The UK had a very serious catastrophe, cost 187 lives in 1989, Piper Alpha. Our chief counsel was intimately involved in investigating that accident. It was after that that the, that the regulator was separated revenues from, from regulation just as we're proposing here. And it was after that that they developed a different mode of regulation, which is known as the safety case, where um, the particular risks that are likely to be entailed in a particular well situation, that is with acknowledgement of the formation, the depth, pressures, and all the rest, be explained by the company and the way in which the company proposes to address those risks be made clear to the regulator. That's their system now. 
Uh, Norway has a similar system, and they came to it after their catastrophe. Australia today, dealing with a blowout that occurred last year, has had a, a commission of inquiry, and they are reforming their own practices. To are you take seeing that happening now? Here, we, we, we know that the industry is very seriously examining the possibility and the practical challenges to creating the safety institute of the sort we recommend. And we very much look forward to having the results of those inquiries and, and uh, hoping, and we very much hope that they will do something along the lines that we've recommended. We think that it's very possible that they will. We certainly know that several CEOs of major companies um, take it seriously. Thanks, General Lady. Uh, Mr. Kaufman of Colorado. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first of all, thank you so much uh, uh, for your work and what you've accomplished. The, um, I, I think you mentioned some things that, that need to be done uh, from your perspective, uh, some kind of international agreement so there's uniform standards. Um, I think you talked about um, responsibility to a spill or an accident if it occurs, that having better definition of that, and, and perhaps um, some insurance requirements reviewing that, uh, liability issues. But, uh, and I think what I'm hearing from you is that um, from the stand, that, that in terms of prevention, so the two aspects, one is, is responding and the other one is prevention. So in terms of prevention, uh, I guess my question to you is, um, did adequate regulations exist, but, it, but was it merely the enforcement of the regulations uh, that was the problems? Because certainly we know that MMS had very significant problems. I, I think there was an IG report in 2008 that talks about how dysfunctional uh, MMS uh, was. And I think that we heard uh, in this situation here how the inspections simply didn't occur in the manner that they were prescribed and were supposed to occur. And so sometimes we get, we have problems, I think, where we, we actually have laws on the books, regulations on the books, but they're simply not being enforced. And so, um, I think that when we look at this, what, what is now the Bureau of uh, Ocean Energy Management Regulation and Enforcement, um, say, Mr. Riley, I, you know, uh, uh, it is reported that you yourself said that personnel working for this agency are, quote, unquote, often badly trained. Uh, Secretary Salazar has said that uh, he has already considered and executed uh, some of the suggestions that your report has highlighted. Hopefully, effective training and a cultural shift at his organization were implemented as well. Uh, do you believe that these reforms, um, among the others that Secretary Salazar has said to have made, would have been sufficient uh, to correct the, the missteps that were made uh, by MMS prior to and during uh, the cleanup of the Deepwater Horizon spill? Uh, let's just go into the prevention. Mm -hmm. I mean, prior to. It, it, if, in fact, we had a functional regulatory uh, organization that was enforcing the existing rules, uh, would that have been adequate uh, to prevent the incident that occurred? Let me say, I think that the recommendations that the, and the new policies, prescriptive regulations that the Secretary and uh, BOMRE, uh, Mr. Bromwich, have imposed are, are very desirable and likely to be effective. Uh, negative pressure tests are now prescribed. They were not before. There are a whole range of new requirements that appear to us to make sense. But the reality is that um, the existing personnel complement um, entails uh, an inspector for every 55 rigs. In California, it's one for every six. Um, the answers given to a series of interrogatories of questions posed by the Interior Department and the Coast Guard in their investigations um, make clear that basic um, petrochemical technologies, oil and gas technologies like cementing and centralizing uh, negative pressure tests are not really understood, are not mastered by many of the inspectors who have said, frankly, that they take uh, industry's lead on those technologies. Uh, they have been evolving over time. And um, we simply have to provide um, better formation better training and I think better compensation for the people who are conducting that work. 
So even if today the regulations are sufficient to guard against a repetition of this set of problems, I worry that in a fast evolving industry in three to five years, they may be outdated. And in order to keep them up to date, I think we're going to have to bring up the game among the professionals at the agency. Senator Graham. Yes, I would, uh, uh, I would agree with that. And I believe that uh, our recommendations, uh, such as the independence of the safety function within the Department of Interior, uh, are as important as the decisions that Congress made a number of years ago to make the FBI a quasi-independent agency within the Department of Justice. Uh, just like the FBI, uh, the safety function within the Department of Interior is susceptible uh, to political interference. Uh, and in fact, in the case of the of MFS, it was rampant interference. Uh, and we think that it's a combination of good regulations, uh, uh, competent capacity, adequate capacity, and then insulation from uh, inappropriate external influences that are all part of what's necessary to get us up to world-class standards of safety in this industry. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Time the gentleman has expired. Mr. Sarbanes of uh, Maryland. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you all for being here. I know it's been a long day. I first wanted to commend you on the report. I haven't had a chance to read it uh, from beginning to end, but I did look at a summary. And I think your recommendations based on the findings you made are very, very helpful and will be for, uh, for a lot of us going forward. Uh, my understanding, you've gotten some criticism about whether you had everything in front of you, whether you had the blowout preventer and so forth. Uh, but as I look at the recommendations, they seem to me all to be confined to a kind that you could make uh, with a lot of confidence without having that extra piece of information at your disposal. It doesn't strike me that anything about your recommendations will be changed in any kind of significant way based on other information that comes forward because you've really derived it from what you saw before you. There was also a comment about your recommending layering another uh, bureaucracy on top of a failed bureaucracy. But as I, again, read the recommendations, I think what you're doing is suggesting a reasonable set of regulatory oversight, which in many ways will substitute for what has been a failed uh, bureaucracy. On the issue of bureaucracy, I would ask you to respond to a proposal. This is something I've suggested in um, earlier iterations of legislation addressing the, the uh, oil spill. Uh, it was a provision that we tried to include in the CLEAR Act. And this would be a requirement that the CEO of these corporations, of these companies, would certify, personally certify, with the potential for liability uh, to the adequacy and safety of the response plan, for example. You've talked about, and many have alluded to how these response plans that were developed, really across the industry, it was uh, highlighted in BP's uh, particular oil spill response plan, but were wholly inadequate. And so I'd like you to speak to whether you think we ought to give meaningful consideration, as I'd like to see, to a requirement on the part of the, the corporate CEO to certify that these plans are in fact uh, good plans and that they've done due diligence in creating those plans. And you could do more in terms of changing the, the culture of those companies with that one sort of piece of leverage than a whole new bureaucracy could do. So if you could speak to that, I'd appreciate it. My own sense is that uh, the way such certifications would occur practically is the um, head of uh, offshore or North America would sign a certification. The chief financial officer might sign a certification. The chief safety uh, and environment uh, vice president would sign a certification. And if all of those signatures were present, then the CEO would sign. And I don't know that it would enhance the liability uh, assignment that you would like to see. It might, from a 
from a personal point of view, more closely uh, involve, more intimately include a CEO in a decision that is made. But as uh, Mr. Hayward said, he didn't know anything about the problems that uh, characterized that well situation, did not know that it had been a troublesome well, uh, hadn't been particularly involved in making decisions for it, or apparently didn't even know that it was, uh, that it was uh, coming in late. It's a very large company. And uh, so I'm not confident myself, based on my own experience with boards of directors, that that would contribute that much positively to safety, frankly. I think it think, would... Do you think he would have bothered to know more if he had been required to personally certify as to well, the safety and adequacy of these plans? Well, he would have probably have uh, had to sign scores and scores of certifications without any individual personal knowledge of the degree to which the uh, characteristics of the, of the well situations were uh, familiar to him. And so I have reservations about that particular recommendation. I had a conversation with Mr. Waxman about it. I know that it was strongly supported on the part of the committee. Yeah, but, but from my point of view, and, and it's not that common in other high-risk industries either to try to fix the uh, responsibility at the very top. It's there anyway if the company encounters a 10 to 20 to 30 billion dollar uh, expense, obviously. And now I think everybody's attention is very focused on liability. And to my knowledge, every company has stood down to examine their own vulnerability, their own risk, and get their, get their practices improved. But um, that's my personal judgment. We did not as a, um, uh, I actually consulted our senior um, uh, technology advisor on that particular issue and we gave it some consideration within the commission and did not go forward with it. Mr. Chairman, can I get the senator's answer to that question? Briefly? Yeah. 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 If the senator can do it in 15 seconds, which is a test. <laughs> your, your question was, would this be something worthy of exploring? I think the answer to that question is yes. Mm -hmm. uh, my colleague has done some of that exploring and had, has come to the conclusion that, that he has, but I think it's an, an issue. And frankly, your, your father has given us the opportunity to move this from being a theory to reality, and that is, has it changed the behavior of corporate executives that, that under uh, his legislation, they now are required if, for public companies to sign uh, personally as to the accuracy of their financial statements. It would be interesting to do some oversight and see what the effect of that has been, and then you might be in a better position to evaluate its potential uh, applicability to offshore oil drilling. Thanks. You didn't quite do it, Senator, but nice try. <laughs> well, I got a little bit off. Well, that's all right. You were talking to a son of a senator. I can understand why that happened. <laughs> yeah. Mr. Duncan from South Carolina. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And um, gentlemen, thank you for being here. I, I've sat by this graph all afternoon, and I've studied, <laughs> I've studied it, and I wanted to comment on it because... You're the only one who can read it. <laughs> You've re referenced it several times today, and, um, and you've come to some conclusions that I think are flawed, and here's why. Uh, I spent some time on the MMS uh, OCS five-year planning subcommittee, where we looked at oil and natural gas leases and came up with recommendations for the next five-year plan on where um, those leases would be granted. And it struck me during the time that the only areas that we could even talk about uh, within that committee was Deepwater Western GOM and Deepwater Alaska. And um, near shore, the thousand foot and shallower areas on that grid were off limits for us to even talk about for the next five year period. And so when you see an increase of activity uh, in deep water exploration and production, I think it's directly attributable to the fact that policies uh, of the United States government has pushed oil exploration and production uh, away from the shore, away from the, the marshes and the rivers and other things to uh, deep water. So I, I think some of the conclusions you've come to based on that chart that you've referenced are flawed. Um, so I want to make those comments. And Mr. Chairman, I hope that that us on the on e and &M subcommittee or this committee will continue to look at the policies uh, that are in place that pushed it to deep water and um, continue to look at nearshore, onshore, and other uh, resources going forward. A um, couple of questions for you based on your report um, that are on a whole different line of thinking 
so bear with me. And your report should provide a short review of the firefighting efforts in response to the disaster. And I want to commend the, the guys that went out there on the rescue effort uh, with our Coast Guard and others. And, and this these line of questioning has no bearing on, on their efforts. But the lack of attention to this critical part of the disaster has left many of us uh, confused. In the report, you state that others are going to study this issue more completely. Uh, can you tell me first, and there's going to be three questions here, can you tell me first, uh, in your opinion, if you believe the firefighting efforts um, were properly coordinated, that's number one. The second thing, many believe that firefighting contributed to the sinking of the rig. and uh, Was there a possibility of saving the rig? And uh, would the rig not sinking have permitted the subsea blowout uh, that we saw? Was there a possibility uh, to uh, let the, the oil continue burn? and work on shutting off the flow of oil that was attributing, that was the source of, of fuel for the fire, um, or was the structural integrity of that rig in jeopardy anyway? Um, so if you could uh, answer those in either one. Yeah. Well, I said that one of the lessons learned was that we were very ill prepared to respond, particularly in the critical first hours and days of this. And uh, I would suggest that that included our ability to restrain fire uh, under these uh, circumstances. Uh, if I could, I'd like to go back to your first comments. Uh, I think you ought to also look at the issue of depletion. Uh, we've been heavily uh, mining for oil and gas, the shallow water, since 1938. Uh, continue to do so today. Uh, I believe that these charts are as much a function of the reality that most of where the oil is today, the so-called elephants of offshore oil, are not at 1,000 feet. They're more likely to be at five or 10,000 feet, and that's why that's where the industry uh, is moving. But that might be an, an, a question that uh, your subcommittee could examine as to what are the factors that have gone We'll, we'll pursue that at a later time. Um, let's get back to the firefighting efforts and, and what may have attributed to it because that's a lot of questions in, in my district and around South Carolina and across the, the land that I've heard. So um, do you think the firefighting efforts um, were coordinated? Uh, do you think that uh, the, the rig could have sat there and burned until we shut off the flow of oil uh, underwater uh, and the structural integrity of the rig? Um, was it in jeopardy? Do you have any uh, input on that? The only thing I would say, uh, without um, wanting to characterize a lot of activities that occurred in the chaos of the fire and the response, is that uh, there were moments at various times when well control could still possibly have been established, when um, uh, even the gases that were rising in the drill pipe could have been diverted over the side and perhaps not come into contact with an ignition source and not caught fire. But that once the fire began, when uh, we looked at transcripts of uh, reports of what it was like on that rig and how it seemed like a jet airplane or a, or a fast moving train had just come out of the drill pipe, uh, I'm not sure that there was a great deal that could have been done that would have averted the disaster that did occur. It does occur to us, however, that the degree to which the uh, response to the emergency immediately was characterized by um, a, a lot of chaos of the uh, one of the rescue boats leaving uh, a number of people still on the rig who then jumped into the water and did in fact survive the people who who'd made that choice um, and then discovered uh, those who were in the the evacuation boat that they couldn't get away from the rig as it looked like it was going to topple on them and they discovered it was because that they were tethered by a rope and no one has or was allowed to have a knife on the rig so they had to look for a means of severing the rope it didn't appear to us and the I think the documentation supports this that there had been the kind of drills simulations practices that would have been appropriate and I think probably will be insisted upon in the industry in the future and that is one more change that needs to occur that we have really learned the lesson from. Do you think the rig would have continued burning? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The time of the gentleman has expired. Uh, Mr. Landry of Louisiana. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just for the record, uh, I, uh, I did raise the commission's credentials on my campaign to get here. Uh, maybe they weren't raising it here in June, but I sure were in Louisiana. Um, <clears throat> 
Considering the industry's performance record in the Gulf of Mexico, where over 42,000 wells have been drilled, in addition to 2,500 deep water wells without any significant uh, incidents, uh, that in my opinion reflects a successful risk management. Were these safety factors, and these are yes or no questions, were these, safety, were these facts uh, the success and history of, of all of these wells that have been drilled out in the Gulf of Mexico, were they taken into account when y'all did this report? Yes, sir. Yes. Really? Okay. Was there, <laughs> was there any economical analysis done during the course of this report in terms of the impact on not only the Gulf economy but the national economy as well taken into, impact, in, into account? We know that tens of billions of dollars were damaged, was done to the environment and the economy, primarily uh, of the Gulf as a result of this spill. So you say, is that yes? The answer is yes. The President charged his commission to determine the cause of the disaster to improve the country's ability to respond to spills and recommend reforms that make offshore energy production safer. Prior to the accident, there existed multiple layers of environmental reviews, including multiple EISs at all of the different phases that DOI uses, uh, and EAs, uh, in environmental impact statements and, and uh, environmental assessments. These included an EIS during the development of the five-year review, and again, prior to the uh, lease sales. Where does the Commission receive both the authority and conclusion that the NEPA review warrants any additional changes, as I find that um, no conclusion that it contributed to the accident or uh, to the impact of the cleanup? Well, I think that uh, the uh, increasing emphasis on uh, NOAA, the Coast Guard, uh, other agencies that represent the best science in the government, and our proposal to use best science from outside the government uh, all go to the, our interest in enhanced safety, including understanding uh, what are the risks at the individual sites that are being suggested uh, and what are the potential adverse effects on uh, the safety of those who will be operating in that area and the uh, environmental quality of the Gulf. Uh, so the answer to your question is yes, uh, we took those into uh, account as part of our overall uh, assessment. Uh, we are aware of the fact that the industry, uh, and per particularly uh, certain, certain companies within the industry, have had a very strong safety record. We're not saying that everybody was the same, but we are saying that we think that the, the overall record in the Gulf uh, is uh, uh, stunningly uh, below what it is in the standard of the world. If our aviation industry uh, had a record that uh, by a three to five to one ratio, we were killing more people in airplanes than, for instance, Great Britain was, we'd be pretty upset about why this was happening. That happens to be about the case in this industry uh, between Norway and Great Britain uh, and the U.S. Uh, we're, we believe it's in the spirit of America to want to be the best. Uh, I'm, I'm glad you brought areas. that up, Senator. And um, that these I'm, recommendations will move us. I'm also, I'm also confused that you would make the suggestion that underreporting incidents in the U.S. because the numbers are low. Are you aware that the industry as a whole regards, regards the European standards of reporting incidents very less reliable than the U.S.'s? I'm not aware of, of the assessment of that uh, by the U.S. industry. I am familiar with the fact that our fatality to accident ratio is, is significantly different uh, than it is in the North Sea, uh, which raises questions as to whether we are capturing uh, all of the accidents that, in fact, are occurring. Uh, I, I'm unaware of any evidence that would indicate that there should be such a significant differential between uh, the fatalities and accidents in the Gulf and in the North Sea. We, well, we, I will be supplementing uh, some questions to y'all and, and figures that I, I could just I, add. I, we I, are aware that there are very different ways of categorizing incidents, accidents, 
fatalities, days lost, and so forth, total recordables in the North Sea versus the Gulf, different jurisdictions even between the UK and Norway. So some of those data uh, need to be very closely scrutinized to determine uh, that you're dealing with oranges and oranges, not apples and oranges. But on both sides, you would agree. To. Yes, I would. You know, I yes, want to make sure that it, it's not just a one-way street. But I think the less disputable <laughs> number is the fatality number. It's a little harder to hide the bodies. And uh, so I think we're confident that those numbers are as we found and that they're disturbing. Time of the gentleman has expired. Mr. Flores from Texas. Mr. Chairman, thank you for t holding today's hearing. And uh, Chairman Riley, Chair Gr Chairman Graham, thank you for joining us today. I know you've uh, put in a lot of work on your report and the study, and we appreciate you uh, uh, being here today. I have an opening statement that I'd like to give to, uh, for the, to, uh, give to the uh, Chairman for the record. Uh, we'll dispense with that for now. It's been nine months since the Macondo well accident, and we all grieve for the uh, 11 families that lost loved ones and for those that were injured and for the impact uh, on several families along the Gulf Coast. Uh, I want you to know from a personal standpoint that I lost a brother in the oil drilling business, and so I have as much interest in, in conducting uh, this industry as safely as possible as anybody in this room. Um, but that said, I, I want to make sure that we facilitate a robust oil and gas industry because it's integral to our economic security and our, our military security. Uh, and as a person who was actively involved in the offshore uh, energy business for over 30 years, I am keenly aware of the, um, uh, the cons or keenly concerned about the, the recommendations in the Commission's report. I think it's interesting that you use the Three Mile Island analogy because, as you, as you pointed out, uh, after Three Mile Island, we have not started and completed the construction of a nuclear power plant in 30 years. It appears we're headed down the same road today with offshore drilling. We have a, uh, a permit moratoria, a de facto moratoria in deep water, and we've got an incredible slowdown in shallow water drilling. And we're already seeing that show up in higher oil prices, higher gasoline prices at the pump, and reduced economic activity along the Gulf Coast. Here's the issue. Congress has passed legislation. You want Congress to consider legislation. The Department of Interior has issued new regulations. Lease sales have been canceled. Other areas of potential offshore, uh, for offshore activity have been put off limits again. And it's all based on a report that doesn't provide a full postmortem of what happened. Let me, and here's, here's the key phrase that's used that causes the concern. You keep referring to systemic industry-wide failure. On chapter, chapter four, on January, of the report dated January 6, you had the following key finding. The well blew out because a number of separate risk factors, oversights, and outright mistakes combined to overwhelm the safeguards meant to prevent just such a happening. But most of the mistakes and oversights of Macondo can be traced back to a single overarching failure, a failure of management Better management by BP, Halliburton, and Transocean would almost have certainly prevented the blowout by improving the ability of individuals involved to identify the risk they faced and to properly evaluate, communicate, and address them. So how, do, how, do you just, I mean, how can you reconcile between what's happened in the offshore energy business today to calling a systemic failure, a systemic industry-wide failure to report? which really just gets down to three companies. And we put the entire nation's economy in peril by doing this. Understand? Let me give you an example. What if we find out, after we get the BP fully, the uh, blowout preventer fully evaluated, it takes a $10 bolt that could cure the problem 99.999% of the time. And then this, is, this accident will essentially never happen. And that's about the ratio of accidents to wells drilled that we've got. Uh, in deep water. So, you know, we, we've gone overboard. So why did we use those words, systemic industry-wide failure? Because that's what's caused the, the, the paranoia here. In 1963, uh, Congressman, it was a single weld, as I understand it, that sank the Thresher submarine. And a uh, subsafe system de was developed, and we've not lost a subsafe s submarine since we lost one every third year on average in peacetime before that. The reason that 
we concluded it's systemic and we didn't come in or I didn't come in believing it was a systemic problem, I thought it was a single company that had blundered fatally, is because of the very large presence of those three companies throughout the oil and gas industry in the deep water and in the shallow water throughout the world. BP is, I think, the largest explorer of offshore oil and gas development. Uh, Transocean is the largest rig operator. And Halliburton is the largest supplier of, of resource help, such as cementing. It uh, is no longer possible for most companies to test the cement, for example, that they're provided by a Halliburton. They no longer have the research capacity. Chevron does, maybe one or two more do, but most decided in the 80s and 90s to become, uh, to contract that out. So the, the cement that is provided is the cement that gets used. And the cement that was provided by the tests that Halliburton itself conducted and our commission had conducted was faulty. It is simply inconceivable to us that it, this was a problem so exclusive, so specially uh, circumstantial with respect to one rig, especially since we know in Australia the cementing failed in the Montara, Montara well uh, just a year and a half or so ago also. Um, this is something that um, caused us to believe, and again, the, most of the people on that rig were Transocean employees, the people who were uh, responsible for responding to the emergency, as I just described. That's the largest rig operator and owner in the world. It operates for, for everybody. Uh, everybody hires Transocean. Uh, they also are implicated in this in uh, significantly uh, uh, failing to detect gas rising in the drill pipe. We concluded from that that all companies are at risk if they're using these two contractors or BP itself is probably at risk in other places. Now we did hear and we asked the Norwegian regulators, are you taking any actions against BP? The answer was somewhat surprising, no, we are not, because we do not see issues in the North Sea with respect to BP operations, and therefore we've taken no action to discourage their continued operation. That posed the question to us, well, what is it about the North Sea and the Gulf that has our companies operating safely and protectively in the North Sea, subject to a different set of regulation, regulators, and not in the Gulf? And uh, that caused us to look very closely at the degree of uh, oversight, the quality of regulation, and the capacity of the regulators, which we also fault. Uh, the time of the gentleman has uh, expired. I, I, I wanted to let that uh, response come because that, that I know is uh, very important to the gentleman from Texas. Mr. Rivera from uh, Florida. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, gentlemen, for being here today. Commissioner Graham, Senator Graham. Um, as a as a Floridian and as a, I believe as my neighbor, are you still living in the lakes? Are you still in Miami Lakes? I am. Yep. West of the Palmetto. Yes. Well, I'm right there with you in Doral, right down right down the road. So, as as my distinguished constituent, um, <laughs> as my distinguished constituent and Florida Floridian, um, I know we we share a great concern for for the economy and the environment of our state of Florida. Uh, one of the recommendations that you make in your report um, addresses the need for greater international scrutiny and international standards. Um, as a representative from South Florida, I'm deeply concerned about the ongoing development off the coast of Florida, ongoing oil development off the coast of Florida and off the coast of Cuba in particular. As you know, as we speak, there are a number of companies, including Repsol, interested in drilling in the waters off of Cuba. And I want to ask you, do you believe that this Cuban drilling between the coasts of Florida and, and, and Cuba will be done safely? And what could the U.S. do to ensure that any lax Cuban oversight doesn't threaten Florida and the southeastern United States? Well, I am concerned about the safety, uh, the relative lack of experience of the uh, Cubans in terms of uh, being able to oversee this activity. The record of some of the companies that are being brought in to do this work is not uh, comforting. Uh, I believe that something analogous to uh, what uh, Mr. Riley has said, uh, that we need to have a Gulf of Mexico wide set of safety standards that would apply to any country touching the Gulf uh, uh, is the best assurance that the United States has against uh, in, uh, inappropriate, unsafe practices 
uh, in our backyard. Uh, and uh, I uh, uh, believe that there is a sufficient interest, at least between the United States and Mexico, to move forward in that direction. Uh, and uh, as Mr. Riley has indicated, uh, the Mexicans have suggested at least that they might be the interlocutory to uh, Cuba to get it involved. To me, it also underscores the importance of the United States having the highest standards. If you go into a negotiation and you're urging the other parties to take their game up a notch and you have not already done that, uh, your persuasiveness is uh, limited. Uh, to me, for our own protection and for our ability to raise the, the standards in the Gulf, uh, that uh, we need to adopt policies such as those we've suggested. Well, to, to that end, following through on that, do you believe that responsible domestic development in the eastern Gulf of Mexico would result in additional oil spill response capabilities being staged in Florida that could be used to respond to a potential spill off of Florida from the Cuban dictatorship's oil drilling efforts? When you say in the eastern Gulf, you mean yes. in the U.S. waters or yes. in Cuban waters? No, U.S. waters. Uh, I would, I, I don't know what the ultimate treaty might say, but I would, I would uh, be surprised if it did not uh, make it the sovereign responsibility of each of the countries uh, to provide that kind of capability for those wells within their own area. And I certainly don't think the United States ought to be depending upon Mexico providing them uh, the uh, containment and response capability. We ought to do that. The Mexicans ought to do it. And if the Cubans uh, proceed with their plans, they ought to do it. So the answer would be no. Thank you. Thank you. Time of the gentleman has uh, expired. Mr. Uh, another gentleman from Florida, Mr. Sutherland. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, uh, I, and thank you for your report. Thank you for appearing before us today. Uh, I am from Panama City, Florida. Um, I, uh, uh, my uh, district is the second uh, district of Florida. Uh, I took my baby steps on the beaches of Panama City, uh, and uh, I love um, uh, our environment. Uh, and, and, and a day with my family, with my children on Shell Island uh, is a little piece of heaven. Uh, for me, uh, I will tell you. So, 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 my community, uh, friends, dear friends of mine, were deeply affected by this disaster. One of the things I wanted to ask you too, and it, it, I just want to ask uh, some brief questions. Number one, how much responsibility, in light of the the um, uh, this disaster, how much responsibility do you believe uh, that the government bears uh, after having cited 790 violations? How much responsibility do they bear? Also, by uh, refusing to waive the Jones Act and bringing in oil ships that have the ability to clean up that oil, okay, by, by oil leaders around the world that have produced those ships, how much responsibility bear, it should be bared by this government? We did inquire into the application of the Jones Act and, and the allegations that have been made, particularly by the Europeans and a couple of commissioners of the European Union, that we were keeping out Belgian and Dutch response capability. And the response we received from the Coast Guard is that uh, their offers of help were looked at, largely um, not taken into account, I guess mostly not taken into account because they were not considered necessary at the time or useful for the particular uh, task. But I know that uh, in Mississippi, there were, from France, um, a series of skimmers, uh, six or eight skimmers or something, that were brought in and uh, were used. So there, it was possible, in other words, to, to get out help from other countries. My sense, frankly, is that the Coast Guard was uh, sufficiently preoccupied with uh, its own response that uh, vetting applications from other companies and uh, countries and other technologies was probably something that in real time they didn't have an awful lot of time to give. If I could just say, I think this goes back to a theme of today, and that is you don't, uh, you don't do basic research while the fire uh, is uh, out of control. 
uh, if you haven't done it before the fire, uh, it's not likely to be very effective. So I think that things like the- I, under I understand, Senator, but when you've got a neighbor that's, that's, that's willing to bring uh, a boatload of hoses, uh, you accept those hoses uh, and, and, and you say, you know what, my first priority, my first priority is to put out the fire. Okay, and I have to tell you, I get angered when I think of the pain that we have experienced along that Gulf Coast. And I think of my dear friends who are no longer in business. It angers me. Mm -hmm. And yet today we want to talk about the responsibility of BP and how they should self-regulate their industry. Okay, when 790 violations were noted, that is incompetent. And yet we have, you know, the idea that we're going to have CEOs stand up and sign a letter of certification certifying liability. I want secretaries of, in, of interior and regulatory department heads to sign those same documents. Okay? The American people are tired of sending their money to Washington, D.C., and Washington be the problem. I am angered by the response of this government in light of this disaster. I am angered by the same government that failed in its response to Katrina. And until we start looking inward and take personal responsibility for the lives we are destroying, instead of assessing blame, it's gotta be somebody else's fault. The responsibility is here. The buck stops here. And I'm bothered that, that this commission, decisions, there should be 10 down here. And the bottom I wrote, government's decision to aid and abet. Was there a less likely alternative available? Yes. Less time than alternative? Yeah, they save time. Decision maker? The federal government on shore. And I'm bothered, okay, that we're just going to add to the bureaucracy when the bureaucracy was the problem in many ways. May I answer that question, Mr. Chairman? You, you, you sure can. You, you, uh, you, you raise an important question that uh, we address with respect to safety and uh, personal safety, occupational safety, and health on the rigs themselves. Presently, um, under, uh, w when a rig is under sail or in motion, it is the responsibility of the Coast Guard to ensure uh, safety. Uh, we recommend that BOEM RE have the full responsibility on the rig for safety of personnel and um, that it understand and have the capability to enforce that so that uh, there is not a division of responsibility or a confusion about whether this is a delegated responsibility from OSHA to the Coast Guard and, uh, and the role of MMS in all of this, that it be, that it be amalgamated in one, in one agency. On the Jones Act, the key issue in my view there is to have procedures going the, in place ahead of time so that the extensive permitting reviews and approvals by the State Department are not necessary once the catastrophe may have occurred. And let, I, that was what I was going to say, is that you need to anticipate. And I would suggest that this committee could make a significant contribution uh, uh, in doing uh, some th uh, serious thinking about what are the, the questions, what are the resources, what are the potential impediments uh, when we have the next disaster. It won't be exactly like this one, but we'll, we will have more disasters, and how can we by anticipating, take actions that will avoid uh, the hoses not being uh, <laughs> delivered. Yeah. Time of the gentleman has expired. Uh, the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Thompson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, gentlemen, thank you for your testimony. Um, I, someone had offered an analogy of, uh, of uh, airline analogy earlier, and as I've looked at and read through and tried to synthesize uh, this Commission's recommendations, if I applied the Commission's recommendations to the airline industry, essentially with one plane crash, we would shut down all airplanes and, and frankly, all airports. Um, I apologize for being late. I was in a workforce hearing and I had an opportunity to, uh, to question uh, Governor McDonnell um, from Virginia. And specifically, my questions were about the impact of, of, the, of, of the administration's response and shutting down offshore as a result of this. And the fact, here's some of the statistics he, and I'll be quick with this and I have my questions. Um, he indicated that, uh, uh, that, you know, this industry would create more than 1,900 new jobs in, just in Virginia, increase the state's gross domestic product by $365 million annually, and generate approximately $19.48 billion in federal, state, and local revenues. 
Um, Senator Graham, Secretary Riley, page two of your testimony states, quote, but most of the mistakes and oversights at Macondo can be traced back to a single overarching failure, a failure of management by BP, Halliburton, and Transocean, end quote. And under key, the key facts, you also stated that the investigation team identified several human errors, engineering mistakes, and management failures. You know, based on those statements, a logical person would conclude it wasn't the lack of adequate science and engineering, but the proper application of science and engineering by those on the rig that result, resulted in the Deepwater Horizon Macondo tragedy. You know, basically, yes or no, do you agree with that conclusion? Well, I think it was uh, part of the responsibility of, of effective management uh, is to understand the risk and take steps to mitigate the risk. The fact is that there was no effective plan uh, in place or capability to implement a plan. I agree, it was, it was uh, management. I think that is a or, failure or, of or, management to or, do or, effective uh, risk analysis and take steps to mitigate the risk. Great, thank you. Secretary, any thoughts? I would support that. Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. Um, on page seven of your testimony, you state under the headlines of reforming industry safety practices, quote, government oversight must be accompanied by oil and gas industry's internal reinvention, sweeping reforms that accomplish no less than a fundamental transformation of its safety culture, end quote. Um, internal reinvention, sweeping reforms, and fundamental transformation, you know, frankly, of an entire industry is what the implications of this, of the result of these recommendations, frankly, are words of alarm and cast a, a very wide net. Uh, I assume that they're based on a thorough review of the hundreds of companies involved in U.S. energy production, and not just three companies, despite how large they are, that were mentioned in the report. Did the Commission conduct such a review? We conducted a review of the uh, incident itself of accident data, so your, so your data review throughout the industry. So I think you've answered my question. Your review was of three companies out of perhaps thousands. Well, it's of 79 losses of well control in the last, uh, whatever, 20 years or so, uh, affecting a very large number of companies operating in the Gulf. No, I understand. Uh, so, uh, so, it, so the review, you know, frankly, there's 3,500, number I looked at, 3,500 rigs in offshore production and thousands of companies engaged in the production, uh, but the conclusion was really based on looking at three companies. Well, the inferences drawn for the uh, likelihood of entailed risk with those three companies largely rest upon what we learned from the experience of those three companies, but we had d significant data about uh, many other companies and their experiences that caused us to use the term systemic. And I, I appreciate, you know, trying to, that you're, taking that inference from there, but essentially inference is drawn from three companies, but frankly casting a pretty wide net with your recommendations impacting mm -hmm. thousands of companies. Uh, uh, but um, if I could uh, add to that, you, know, you, you made the allusion to, and I had suggested, if the United States had a four fatalities to one ratio in, mm -hmm. uh, in airline accidents vis-a-vis, -vis, let's say, Norway or the United Kingdom, I believe the American public would be outraged. That is the situation between the North Sea and the Gulf of Mexico. Well, uh, that's it, and I don't think that one company. If I can reclaim my time, because I know I'm going to get gaveled out here. I'm new on the committee. Uh, the uh, um, I, I think the American people would also be uh, pretty irate. They would be saddened with the loss of one life due on an airplane accident. No doubt about it and they would be concerned with that airplane crash. But they would also be irate if, if, the, if the, uh, the federal government essentially shut down the entire airplane industry uh, as opposed to really focusing on drilling down, no pun intended, uh, and systematically determining the root cause of that airplane crash. And I, I obviously out of time. Congressman, neither, right. neither Senator Graham nor I nor our commission are here to defend the moratorium. Not for, not for a minute. Very good. Okay. 
Uh, time of the gentleman has, has expired. That completes the first round, but several members have uh, expressed an interest to, to follow up on their first questions. And Senator Graham, while I didn't ask you, I asked uh, Mr. Riley, and he says, I have all the time in the world, so he's going to have to answer to you if that's, you know, however you want to work that. Uh, let me start. Uh, Mr. Grijalva had a, um, a follow-up, so let me recognize Mr. Grijalva for five minutes. Thank you very much. And uh, let me, uh, uh, at the outset, thank, uh, thank the gentleman. For, uh, for your presence here and for a compelling report. Uh, I, I would, uh, the only question, I think it, it, I, page 142 to 143 in your report, you deal with the issue of the Jones Act that came up, that it was not indeed an impediment to getting foreign assistance or outside assistance to come uh, to the aid of that spill. Also, there's comments there after the governor uh, insisted on those berms that they probably created more problems than they solved. Uh, but the question, I think, has to deal with the word that some of my good friends found offensive, and that is the issue of systemic. Uh, we have here, and I think your report is compelling because it deals with, with the role of government and the lack of oversight on the part of the federal government as a contributing factor to the laxness that we found. And it deals very directly with systemic issues that occur within the management and the operation of the industry. I think the report is compelling. We might, uh, the, in, in so far as something needs to be done. And if we want to raise the standard of oil production offshore, where it's safe, both for, for life and, uh, and, and for the environment, then this report needs to be responded to. The recommendations that you made for legislative action are sound. We, I don't agree with all your recommendations, nor do I, I assume it, every member agrees with everything in there. It is a sound framework. There are principles in there that we must deal with. I want to thank you for that, for the time that you took, and for, I would assume, the seriousness in which we are going to take this report. So thank you for your time, and thank you for the report. As I said, compelling necessary and timely. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Okay, thank the, the gentleman. Uh, let me go to uh, Mr. Landry of uh, Louisiana. Mr. Landry. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I'm having trouble uh, understanding uh, how y'all can come to the conclusion that there's these systemic failures by using those three companies and claiming that because those three companies do such a large percentage of the work in the Gulf of Mexico, uh, that every time they go on a job, they are using the same protocols in engineering uh, for the different customers that they are doing business with. That simply is not true. Uh, there are different well designs that are, that are uh, in place by different oil and gas uh, companies. Some of those well designs, uh, I might add, um, have been around since the inception of deep water drilling. But I, and so I, I don't understand how you came to this, this decision of a systemic failure. Why not look at those oil and gas companies who have drilled successfully without incident, looking at the well design and saying this type of well design seems to be the safest. Uh, in my opinion, it certainly would save the taxpayers a lot of bureaucracy if y'all took a look at <clears throat> those different designs. Did y'all take a look at the different well designs? And, 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 and did you take in mind that they did not, that when those contractors work for different oil and gas companies, uh, they don't follow the same protocols and engineering specs? We did look at the uh, design of this particular well and uh, at least two companies made clear to us that uh, they would not have chosen the design that BP did for that formation in that place. But, but Mr. Riley, and I, I, I apologize for cutting you off, but you told me earlier that you took into account the 3,200 or the 2,500 wells that were drilled in deep water. You told me you took into account their history and their success, but yet now you're telling me that you only took into account the well design on BP, on, on, on BP's Macondo well. Well, the, the conclusion that the well design that was used by, the, by BP at Macondo was not an appropriate one or is one that created more risks than were necessary in the eyes of at least two companies is based upon a judgment about alternative well designs of the sort that you suggest. 
Well, well I'm, I'm, I'm asking, I'm trying to clarify your answer. I mean, did you look at the other well designs and take into account that when you, when you issued your report telling us that there is a systemic failure in the industry and that we have to create these additional levels of bureaucracy costing the taxpayers hundreds of millions of dollars um, uh, when, when you made that, that, that recommendation, did you or did you not look at the history of the other deep water wells, the 2,500 or so, mm -hmm. that have been drilled in the Gulf of Mexico when you took into account issuing this report? Yes, yes sir, we did. And let me say, from the point of view of uh, someone who considers one in 2,500 uh, not so impressive, frankly, if it's going to cost 40 or $50 billion to the economy of the area and to the company involved. I think we're drawing a different conclusion from the success rate. I regulated at the Environmental Protection Agency for, uh, with respect to a number of uh, issues, one in a million, uh, which was the maximum acceptable impact or fatality, mortality, premature death associated with a certain kind of decision, a pesticide decision, for example. So one in 2,500 doesn't impress me as a very positive record, frankly. Well, well, I certainly would like you to look in the eyes of the people who are losing their jobs down in Louisiana, who have built this industry, who have basically been drilling since 1947 off of that mm -hmm. coast, and tell them that. I can tell you from living down there that safety is number one. It has been for a very, very long time. Congressman, the decision to deny them their jobs and to shut down every rig in the deep water area, every exploration rig, is one that I think is uh, highly tendentious, uh, excessive, and hard to justify and uh, have made that clear, as has Senator Graham from the outset. We would have approached this in a more selective fashion so as not to penalize those companies that had not been specifically implicated in the disaster. Um, after some short period of review and inspection, which did in fact take place and they were cleared. So we're not here uh, to defend the denial of jobs or, the, or, or against the resumption of activity in the Gulf. Very much we want to see it resume, but we want to see it resume safely and effectively. And well, may I'll I put your name in as a recommendation to take Ms. Browner's place then? <laughs> <laughs> I, Congressman, I, 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 I have to, I have to uh, take some uh, exception to the statement that you made about that we're recommending hundreds of millions of dollars of additional uh, regulation. Yes, we are recommending that there be an adequate, competent, politically insulated safety function within the U.S. Department of Interior. I don't think those are radical uh, suggestions. Uh, number two, we're recommending that the industry, as other high-risk industries have done, assume more responsibility for their own evaluation of safety. Uh, that's no cost to the U.S. Uh, government, and I think is a very prudent suggestion uh, to the industry and one which will contribute uh, to the industry's long-term uh, viability. So uh, I just, if, if you see something in our report that you think is a hundreds of billions of dollars or millions of dollars of additional expense uh, and an excessive addition to bureaucracy, uh, I would like to, to be directed towards that because that was not our intention. Time of the gentleman has expired. Mr. Flores. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, with the backdrop that I introduced earlier today, and that is we've got lease sales that have been canceled, uh, offshore areas that have been taken off the, uh, the, uh, the availability list to be drilled on in the future, higher gas prices, lower domestic oil production, lost jobs, a hurt economy. Uh, with that, and, and a lot of that is because this report is being relied upon to uh, continue moratoria, either de facto or regulatory, or however they want to be described. And it goes back to this system, this uh, systemic industry-wide uh, failures comment. Co-Chairman William Riley stated on your January 6th release, on Chapter 4's release, my observation of the oil industry indicates that there are several companies with exemplary safety and environmental records. So a key question posed from the outset of this tragedy is do we have a single company, that being BP, that blundered with fatal consequences or a more pervasive problem of a complacent industry? 
Given the documented failings of both Transocean and Halliburton, both of which serve the offshore industry in virtually every ocean, I reluctantly conclude that we have a system-wide problem. That's your quote. Now, Mr. Riley, based on what I see in the, of the internal inconsistency and the weight which this report is being given and the energy future of this country, I would respectfully ask the Commission if they will amend the report to remove the word system-wide industry failure. Will you do well, that? Congressman, how would, how would you defend the presence of uh, walrus protection in polar bears in a response plan? Or how would you defend Mr. Hayward's telling me there's no subsea containment capability? Um, or the inadequacy of the response technology and the failure to invest in it over the last 20 years after we experienced the disaster in Prince William Sound? I, th I think these speak for themselves, and, and, there's, and the response plans were not confined to the three companies. All the majors that we looked at had the same literal literally the same response plans and the same concern for walruses and the, and the dead expert and all the other things we know. And, and several CEOs have said they found it embarrassing and were humiliated by it, and that had a lot to do with their decision to create the Marine Well Containment Corporation, which is a very significant and positive step on the part of the industry. So I, I don't think that you can infer anything other than, it, it, well, it sure looked like complacency, and when people say we never thought it could happen, we just, and I include myself in that, um, we were complacent. I think the government was, the industry was, I was. Well, uh, again, the, the applications for permits that are filed are based on pretty much cookie cutter requirements that the MMS, or the, what was formerly called MMS, used to issue. And, and I don't exempt them from the criticism. Okay, and, and so maybe there was a regulatory failure mm -hmm. as part of it. I think we all agree that there, that there was. And we all agree that BP had an integral, integral part to play in this failure. Um, but unfortunately, what's been condemned here is the entire industry, as well as the energy security of this country going forward. And I think it, it goes back to those words, industry-wide systemic failure. And I just, I respectfully disagree with you. I don't think that we have that type of a failure. And I would, uh, I'd like to state for the record, I think those words ought to be struck from the report. Well, let me just say that our report is 11 days old, and the degree to which there has been a delay in issuing permits or a de facto moratorium has been referred to, I don't think has anything to do with this report. And we certainly don't expect or didn't intend that we would contribute to that. Uh, we, in fact, uh, were assuming that uh, a number of these recommendations could be could be implemented coterminously with a resumption of activity on, on the part of the companies that weren't in any way involved in the Macondo disaster. Thank you. I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Uh, Congressman Thompson. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, just one, one additional question. Um, on page six, of your testimony under the heading environmental review, you state that the commission recommends, quote, a more robust and more formal interagency consultation process in which NOAA in particular has provided a heightened role, but ultimate decision-making authority is retained by the Department of Interior, end quote. And my question, I was, I wanted to, and to get your, your rationale behind it, you know, obviously, you know, uh, uh, the role of NOAA was of great concern to the commission. Uh, my, my question actually is, shouldn't the Departments of Energy and Commerce have an equal, if not greater, voice in NOAA in the formulation of rules and regulations that uh, gr certainly uh, have a great influence on our domestic energy production? Well, just let me clarify, NOAA is part of the Department of Commerce. Uh, so, assumedly, through NOAA, uh, Commerce, views Commerce of the Department, be involved. How about energy? Yeah, Department of Commerce would be involved. Uh, what we were focusing on there is, what uh, I mentioned in my opening statement, a key fact to understand is that the relationship of the United States government to the offshore oil industry is not just as a regulator. It's not like the relationship of the Department of Transportation uh, to the bus uh, industry of America. It is also the relationship of the owner of the property. All of that property out there in the Gulf of Mexico beyond the state limits uh, belongs to the people of the United States of America. We've made a decision that we will lease portions of that to oil companies under certain conditions uh, to uh, 
evaluate and if found, uh, extract oil and gas. Uh, we have the same interest that if you owned a small shopping center that you don't want to have a tenant uh, in your center who is trashing it uh, and is going to make it impossible for other tenants to have a profitable uh, uh, enterprise. So I think we need to put ourselves in the position of what should we be doing to assure that our children and grandchildren uh, will have a Gulf of Mexico that is uh, of a quality that we'd be proud uh, to, uh, to hand over to them as our uh, inheritance. Uh, I, don't, I think these recommendations, and particularly the recommendations of bringing the best science, uh, and we think the Department of Commerce and NOAA represents the best science in this area, to bear in terms of uh, what should be the conditions of our uh, proposed tenant to lease our property is not uh, an imprudent thing to do. Okay. Well, I, one of the, um, as I came to Congress two years ago, one of the things that uh, just appalled me, and it, you know, and this is over different administrations, different parties, is the absolute lack of a national energy plan Goodness. in this country. And when we're talking about our continental shelf and offshore resources or onshore resources, you know, frankly, uh, you know, the Energy Department was formed for that very purpose. Uh, to achieve uh, energy uh, independence, I, I, I guess, in the 80s when it happened. It has failed miserably, and, uh, um, but I, th I think the prop one of the proper steps, obviously, would be involved in this type of a process. I'm completely in agreement with that. In, in fact, it was my position, and I think this is reflecting the report, that you can't answer the question, what's the future of the offshore industry without answering the larger question, what is our energy policy uh, in the United States? Um, I was telling Bill, and he would already seen it, that in yesterday's newspapers there were some articles about the fact that the RAND Corporation uh, had raised questions about whether the U.S. military could convert to a less fossil dependent uh, Navy, Air Force, Army, uh, and they raised serious doubts about whether that could be done, which to me just underscores the importance of this industry uh, for our fundamental national security. Great. Well, thank you. Thank you, gentlemen, for your testimony. I have additional questions, but I will uh, we'll forward those along. Okay. Thanks. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Grijalva. Thank you. And this gentleman, I swear, are the last <laughs> questions. Uh, we all need to be outside enjoying the blizzard that's happening. Yeah. Uh, uh, we can stay here. There's no place else to go. Gentlemen, uh, and both of you have said that the resumption of, and full production of offshore drilling in terms of energy production uh, is something that you want to see and that could be occurring as we make the other kinds of adjustments that we have to make to make this uh, industry safer and our role as a government uh, stronger. Uh, and one of the key recommendations that uh, the commission made is that the federal uh, oil and gas regulators have, that have been underfunded, I think uh, they're getting less now than they did 20 years ago, uh, that we create a dedicated funding stream for oil and gas fees to fund this. Uh, so it's well-trained, professional, uh, a level of an insulation of independence. And yet, as we're talking about this and the critical need to deal with the production issue that has come up consistently here by my colleagues, uh, we're also talking about uh, reductions to 2006 levels, to 2008 levels, based on the resolutions that, we, uh, that we're dealing with on the floor. So... At some point, this full production restoration idea and concept that you support as commissioners, uh, with the backdrop of not ever meeting the commission report in terms of providing a robust oversight regulatory function for government that's independent, how do you reconcile that one opinion with the lack of resources on the other end? If any comment would be fine. Well, it's our recommendation that, like is the case with most other industries, uh, industries who don't have this additional characteristic of being our tenants, uh, we expect the airline industry, the telecommunications uh, industry, uh, 
across the board virtually to pay for their own regulation. They are self-funded regulations. Right. We did not see any compelling reason why that should not be true of this uh, industry. So that would be our basic recommendation. Now, it would take Congress action uh, if, for instance, there were a, uh, as there is now uh, for the, uh, uh, the oil liability fund, there's a, uh, a, a fee attached to each barrel of oil, I believe that's both imported as well as domestically uh, produced, which goes into that fund. Maybe we need to have a, a supplemental stream uh, of, to go into a fund uh, for the regulation of the industry so that we can assure to the industry that we will have a competent, sustained uh, ability to, well, well, to assure Senator, safety I'm, I'm and environment. On my safety. question, if, if I may, uh, you, don't, you see a linkage and not an either-or proposition. I mean, either-or. Either you have the regulatory capacity and the resources to deal with the, 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 re, the demand for full production, and if that linkage doesn't occur, is it an either-or proposition? No, my, Can you my, have one without the other? Well, the answer is I don't think uh, it's in the interest of the American people uh, not to have uh, adequate Thank standards, you. again, uh, in part because of the we've just seen what the consequences are to a lot of very innocent uh, people, uh, and we have seen what the consequences are to an important piece of real estate that belongs to the uh, to all the people of America. Yeah, I think the question is uh, reducing interior uh, levels to 2006, 2008 to directly impact your recommendation in terms of building up the resource capacity and the overall capacity of, of, uh, of regu regulators and oversight. Uh, that does, I think, does not help uh, the safety demands of, for offshore drilling that's also part of the recommendations. Oops. No, sir. If we, we are quite clear that um, the quality of regulation has been insufficient, that uh, an industry which did not used to be a high-risk industry, as it has proceeded so heavily into deep water, has become that. The industry itself needs to take the steps that are suggested by this catastrophe, but so does government. Other governments have done so after their own catastrophes. We mentioned the United Kingdom and Norway, which responded to very severe accidents that they had by, by separating the revenue generating function from the regulatory function and significantly improving the quality of the regulator. Uh, Senator Graham mentioned that in the United Kingdom, the oil and gas industry lobbies for more appropriations for the regulator because they recognize that quality in, in the regulator, as did Mr. Tillerson, the chairman of ExxonMobil in his testimony before us, and Mr. Odom, the chairman or president of Shell uh, USA. Both of them mentioned the quality of regulation as essential to uh, the quality of, uh, of industrial activity. That's all we're really suggesting. So to try to save money at uh, BOEMRE at this point, having seen that budget go down 20 percent over the last 20 years as the oil and gas production in the Gulf went up 300 percent, is really penny wise and pound foolish. Thank you, sir. Yep, the time of the gentleman has expired. Uh, Mr. McClintock, from California. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. First, I'd like to ask unanimous consent to insert into the record the Wood McKinsey report uh, commissioned by the American Petroleum Institute entitled The Impact of uh, Gulf of Mexico Deepwater Permit Delays on U.S. Oil and Natural Gas Production Investment and Government Revenue dated uh, December 2010, uh, which I cited earlier, and I have souvenir copies for our uh, lucky panelists. Without objection, so ordered. Thank you. I'd also like to ask unanimous consent to include the uh, Wall Street Journal editorial, which I referenced. Without objection, so ordered. Mr. Chairman, if I were to summarize uh, what we've uh, learned today, it's this. We faced a, an engineering issue. A blowout preventer failed, and it failed catastrophically. It caused enormous environmental and economic devastation. Before this commission was impaneled, we did not know why that blowout preventer failed. After the commission concluded its work and issued this report, we still don't know 
why that blowout preventer failed. We don't know why it failed because the Commission never even bothered to look at the blowout preventer, which according to the Wall Street Journal is rusting on a dock in Louisiana. We have never had a blowout failure like this one until we find out why it failed. It could happen again. It could happen at any time. And the Commission has not under, uh, advanced our understanding uh, of how to prevent it one bit. The contrast between this Commission's work and the Rogers Commission after the Challenger disaster is staggering. If the Rogers Commission had operated in the same manner, we would still have no idea what caused the Challenger to explode uh, or uh, how to prevent it in the future. We have before us a report offering bureaucratic prescriptions to an engineering problem authored by bureaucrats rather than an engineering prescription authored by engineers. I don't know exactly how, to, how the committee would uh, advance the issue from here. Uh, I would certainly seek the chairman's guidance, but uh, I would recommend that we take whatever action is necessary to impanel a panel of engineering experts to go down to that dock in Louisiana retrieve that blowout preventer, tear it apart piece by piece, find out what caused it to fail, and do so before it happens again. Gentleman Yield. It, I would just uh, respond to that if I might. Uh, sir, I, I think the, you can draw an analogy between the blowout preventer and a seat belt in an automobile accident. It's uh, obviously important to the survival of someone that the seat belt wasn't fastened, but it doesn't really explain why the accident occurred. We explained why the accident occurred, and we fingered and identified, I think, all of the major contributors, the decisions, and their technological consequences, their engineering consequences that led to the disaster. Uh, examining the blowout preventer is not going to cause those other facts that we uncovered to go away. They, uh, they are there, they are distressing, they do have implications for policy, and we tried to draw them. I want to thank uh, both your witnesses for being here today. I know you had a long day. You started at uh, 10 o'clock in the, in the Senate, and I, I very, very much appreciate your willingness to stay here so uh, some of our members uh, can have a, a uh, another explanation uh, or a clarification of what's going on. There, are, I know that there will be some other questions that members, probably on both sides, uh, would like to ask you. And if you would uh, uh, agree to re respond in writing to those questions, we'd uh, very much uh, appreciate that. We have a. Um, we will do that, Mr. Chairman. We have a staff, I think, for another five weeks, four weeks. Okay. And right. uh, we, will, uh, we will use them to the very end, to the extent they allow that. I would just like to say, I would just like to say uh, we very much appreciate uh, the attentiveness, the interest of this uh, committee, the thoroughness of the kinds of questions that we received, right. and understand this, the seriousness of, um, of different kinds of concerns about our report and about uh, the conclusions that we drew. We hope it's, uh, it's helpful to the deliberations of the committee and that um, the relatively modest proposals we've made, and I think they are modest in terms of cost, bureaucracy, disruption, as I mentioned, uh, are looked at seriously and, and perhaps implemented. Well, I, I, I thank you for that. And let me, let me just mention, and again reiterating what I said at the start of this, uh, at the start of the, when the BP well broke, that we had to find out what went wrong. We will continue to do that. As I mentioned in my opening statement, there's two more reports out. We will look at what uh, they have to say uh, and draw hopefully some conclusions from that. Uh, but I also will reiterate what I also said by opening response. What we do here will send a very, very strong signal into what I think is very, very critical long term. And long term is the energy security uh, of our country. Uh, you alluded to that. Uh, so the balance we have to make is make sure that we continue to have a robust industry, uh, especially in a down e economy. So uh, with that, I want to thank uh, all of the members uh, again for, uh, for being here and, uh, and especially for, uh, for the two of you to stay for this long time. And with that, if there's no further business, uh, the, uh, uh, yeah, no, no further business, the meeting stands uh, adjourned.
Tonight on C-SPAN 2, senators pass a resolution honoring the shooting victims in Tucson. Russian President Dmitry Medvedev...